stress change in material, the stress concentration will also decrease. And here is the picture shows the contents to gradient. It could be the material composition, the element dimension, the arrangement, and orientation, and so on. One of the potential applications of FGM in the industry is used in the T-junction part of pipe. At the T-junction, the turbulence caused by the mixing of hot and cold fluid has attracted many researchers' attention. Because the temperature fluctuation in the mixing part may lead to the high circle thermal fatigue in the pipe. And there are three kinds of flow types at the T-junction. Depending on the momentum ratio, flow at the T-junction can be classified as the stratified flow, deflecting flow, and in-piping flow. According to the research conducted by GAEA, the stratified flow case will have larger temperature fluctuation, which may affect the pipe most. And here is a picture show the pipe fail due to the thermal fatigue. The temperature difference in this pipe is only 60 degrees C. So this work aims to evaluate the performance of FGM when applied to the T-junction pipe through one-way fluid structure interaction simulation. In order to complete the one-way fluid structure interaction simulation, first, the conjugate heat transfer between fluid and the pipe should be done. Simulation work in this study was conducted on the axis fluid. And here is the schematic of simulated T-junction pipe. The flow in the main pipe, in the main pipe has a 48 degrees C temperature and 1.46 meter per second velocity, while the flow in the branch pipe has lower temperature, 33 degrees C and 1 meter per second velocity. By calculating the momentum ratio, the simulated flow is a stratified flow. The flow and the pipe parameters are same with the waterlogged experiment conducted by GAEA. For simulating the FGM in the numerical software, the layered model was used, and the three models are used in this study. The one-layer structure steel pipe, which can be treated as the homogeneous material pipe, and then the two-layer is the traditional composite material, and the N-layer is the FGM pipe. The graded two material is structure steel and low thermal conductivity ceramic. In the eight layer model, the material property is calculated from the power law distribution of FGM. And this power law index in the eight layer model is one. So before going to the T-junction pipe simulation, the performance of using layer model to simulate FGM is changed. A transient heat conduction problem in FGM pipe was conducted. As shown in this picture, the pipe has graded thermal conductivity and specific heat. By comparing the temperature distribution and the temperature history between analytical result and simulation result on the layered model, and we can find the 8 layer and 16 layer models could represent the FGM wear and match with the analytical solution. This shows the feasibility of using layered model to simulate FGM in numerical software. So back to the T-junction case. After the validation and the verification of the mesh setting, the final decided mesh information is here. The first layer of fluid at the boundary has a thickness of 1.2 times 10 minus 5 meter, which ensures the Y plus value during the calculation is smaller than one. And this is the requirement for the SST K omega turbulent mode. The average length of the mesh is 4 mm. And with the time step 2 times 10 minus 4 seconds, the maximum current number is 0 0.82. It also satisfies the CFL condition. And both fluid and pipe mesh has nearly 1 mm load. The turbulent model used in this simulation is DES SSTK omega model, which is suitable to the wall bounded flows. And the bounded second order implicit algorithm is used for the transient formulation as required by the DES model. The discretization method on the turbulent term is first order upwind, while the other term is second order or second order upwind. The time step is fixed as 2 times 10 minus 4 seconds, 
and then there are two and carbon atoms. The thickness of carbon bonds tends to be vibration to the entire molecule and show excellent thermal conductivity. These properties are decreasing thermal resistance borne by air bed. And we added cellulose nanocrystal to CNT based bucket paper. Cellulose nanocrystal has strong strength. It can improve durability and reinforce heat conduction and good compatibility with other materials. Next is experimental details. These are samples that have been tested. A total of five bucket paper samples were made. The first sample is untreated CNT. Second, oxidized CNT using sulfuric acid, nucleic acid, and hydrolic acid. Third, in the second oxidized CNT, added to CNC 0.06 weight percent. Fourth, on the oxidized CNT, added to CNC 0.08 weight percent. Lastly, on the oxidized CNT, added to CNC 0.1 weight percent. This slide bucket paper manufacturing process. First, dispersion virtual CNT. To disperse each sample, the trial process was applied for one hour, followed by ultrasonication for two hours. Second, filtration. Distilled water is filtered through the dispersed nanofluid using a vacuum filter, leaving only the virtual CNT particles. Lastly, the filter virtual CNT is dried for one day and separated from the membrane filter. Then, the bucket paper was completed. The ASTM D5470 equation was used to calculate the thermal resistance value. D5470 is a test method that used the thermal equilibrium method to determine the thermal conductivity of the material by using the law that the amount of heat flowing through the sample is the same before and after. As shown in the figure 5, we drill six holes in two copper blocks, including the surface of the copper block, insert the thermal couple and see the temperature change. This equation keeps heat on the top and cool on the bottom. When the temperature of the copper blocks reaches a steady state, we use the temperature to find the thermal resistance value. Figure 6 is experimental setup. A copper block was wrapped with an insulator for an experiment. And on the right, each bucket paper sample was put between the copper blocks. In all experiments, a weight of about 2 kg was applied. Next slide is visual discussion. It is a graph of sample when the steady state is reached. Figure 7 is show temperature graph of respective channel. CNT bucket paper untreated showed a thermal resistance value of 1.526. Next, the thermal resistance value of the oxidized CNT was 1.340. From here, a graph is shown for concentration of CNC added to CNT. The resistance value of bucket paper with 0.06 weight percent of CNC added is 1.217. The resistance value of bucket paper with 0.08 weight percent of CNC added is 1.196. Lastly, 
Thus, Dharma resistance value of the quantity per manufacture by any 0.1 with percent CNC was 2.508. These values are shown in the in the table on the next slide. Looking at the table, it can be seen that a thermal resistance value of oxidized CMT is lower than that of raw CMT. And the thermal resistance value is lowered by adding a certain amount of CNC to it. When 0.1% of CNC was added, the durability of the bulky paper was good, but the resistance value was not good. When comparing the five samples, it was found that the thermal resistance reversible reaction. It has a relatively low enthalpy of dissolution, so it has already been studied as a ammonia storage material in many studies. However, it is not suitable for use with an adsorbent due to the slow reaction rate. Therefore, in the previous hour study, we used it as an adsorbent by increasing the surface area by impregnating magnesium chloride on activated carbon. In this study, the optimal magnesium loaded amount for ammonia adsorption was selected and the optimal process for optimal process was selected in the TSA, PSA and PTSA processes and multi-cycles were performed. 3, 5, 7, 10, 50 and 20 weight percent magnesium were attached to activated carbon by sonication impregnation method. Activated carbon with nothing impregnated was named AC and thus with 3 weight percent magnesium impregnated was named AC MG3. The ammonia absorption test was carried out as a breakthrough test for TSA, PSA, and PTSA processes. And the breakthrough test conditions are shown in the table below. As a result of the BT analysis, the surface areas and pore volume of samples tend to decrease when magnesium was impregnated. However, the reduction in surface area and pore volume is insignificant when the amount of magnesium impregnated is more than 10 weight percent. In addition, the average pore size was constant for all adsorbents. As a result of TJ analysis, AC showed a rapid weight loss at 480 degrees, leaving a final 0.67 weight percent residue. On the other hand, the final weight of the magnesium loaded ACs are higher, higher than that of AC. So we could confirm that the metal was successfully impregnated. Weight loss of magnesium loaded ACs begin at lower temperatures than AC. Nevertheless, it was confirmed that all adsorbents were thermally stable up to 360 degrees. SEM analysis was performed to confirm the surface morphology. AC confirmed a smooth surface and small particles were identified in 
magnesium loaded ACs. These particles are so, and hydrocomplexity characteristic of structure that is effective to good fluid disposability. Thus, it has structure advantages such as excellent mechanical properties like low density and low density. So it was from the cellulose and we can obtain the isolation of the cellulose by acid hydrolysis. Usually using the sulfuric acid on base, also it is composite, composite of OH functional groups. So it has excellent hydro, hydrophilicity. I was expecting this performance uh, from OH functional group. In summary, it is low density, high strength, and elasticity, eco friendly because it came from wood or tree. And last, good fully property is hydrophilicity from the always functional group. And third, I will explain which is used the measurement. To experiment the world drop world angle for hydrophilic or hydrophobic. The contact angle is an optical measurement of the standard used drop shape that is measured to know fluid characteristic as a hydrophobic or hydrophilic. In the steady contact angle, the deposit drop lies on the surface of a solid like baseline. So, as you can see, if the drop shape bigger than 90, 90 degree, it say hydrophobic, and small than uh, 90 degree, it can be say hydrophobic characteristic. So next one is experiment details. The first explanation is about the how how from, uh, how manufacture the various nano fluids before the manufacturing bucket papers? There are two ways for modifying virtual CNT surface. First of all, is using the nitric acid, sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, like figure five. It's using uh so we call it that oxidized. Virtual CNT, namely all CNT. Second of all, is using potassium persulfate and NaOH, like figure 6. We call it that alcoholic virtual CNT, namely ACNT. Or we can introduce functional groups to the CNT surface and tube. So, Oxidation is easy to handle and a common method. The alkalization is eco-friendly and more simple method. So we will compare the bucket paper produced by these two methods with the pristine bucket paper. The case of the pristine virtual CNT do nothing, just only ultrasonic cake. Take it for a minute because we need to focus their own performance so that the um, safer dispersion method for like ultrasonification. So we also added the CNC to improve the durability that's virtual CNT allow lots. The most to look forward to be how the hydrophilicity of the CNT with the leach has a leach high uh, leach always groups will work. After this, after this vessel, we functional we manufacture in a lot of fluid condition for bucket paper as figure eight. Then this solution is filtered to produce bucket paper. Before the contact angle measure, we need to adjust it then because first it, can, it is too big to experiment the world drop because world drop going to suck it in between tubes so we consider that effect the widget so there is there are the reasons for uh, the 
accuracy of the content and to prevent super. A common problem, a common problem in electronic device is managing summer conditions for optimal efficiency. Fundamentally, we can divide electronic technique uh, into two categories: active cooling system and passive cooling system. Active cooling refers to cooling technologies that rely on an external device to enhance the heat transfer. Active cooling system includes forced convection through fans or drawers, which can be used to optimize thermal management. The disadvantages of active cooling are that, are that it requires the use of electricity and has a size limitation. Passive cooling system Passive cooling utilizes nature, conduction, convection, and radiation to cool off compound. Passive cooling system includes heat pipe and heat sink, both of which utilize fundamental heat transfer principle. The advantages of passive cooling techniques lie in the energy efficiency and lower cost, financial cost. Heat pipe has many factors affecting heat transfer performance. I control properties of I control three factors: properties of working place, filling ratio, and heat input. Working flow includes nanofluid, nanoparticles, and was chosen as aluminum. And I focused on two different working fluid properties thermal conductivity and surface tension. Aluminum nanoparticles. Surface tension and thermal conductivity of aluminum fluid with different type of surfactant were measured to identify the effect of surfactant. As you can see the figure 4, aluminum fluid with SDVS surfactant had the lowest surface tension followed by with LB and then with SDS. Although the aluminum fluid added surfactants were significantly decreased than that of aluminum fluid without surfactants, without the release of the type of surfactants. SDS could decrease the surface. However, the fluids with SDS have similar or higher heat transfer coefficients than distilled water in case of exceeding 30% of filling ratio. In conclusion, all kinds of surfactant substantially reduce surface tension of aluminum nanofluid, especially aluminum nanofluid with 1.5 rate percent of SDVS has the lowest surface tension. It was confirmed that the nanofluid with only alumina has the, the highest thermal conductivity, followed by the nanofluid with LB, with SDS, and with SDVS. In other words, the thermal conductivity of aluminum nanofluid increases with the addition of surfactants. It was revealed that the thermal conductivity of aluminum nanofluid was decreased with the addition of surfactants. In particular, 
Aluminum monthly added the 1.5 weight percent of SPDS show the lowest summer productivity. The heat transfer performance of the heat pipe with solution added 1.5 weight percent of SPDS could be improved in case of filling ratio exceeding 30 percent. When the heat when the heating fluid was 15 watts, the effect of reduced surface tension on heat transfer performance of heat pipe obviously appeared. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Singhal, for giving us an interesting... Those are calls that are associated with the management of toxic chemical species which then become a serious environmental concern. Hence, we refer to it as secondary pollution. This also contributes to incurring of additional costs. Well, that's where the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal Report comes in, which advocates for circular economy in waste beneficiation, thereby moving away from waste disposal. Different studies have been focusing on value recovery and valorization. In value recovery, we talk about minerals that are recovered through different technologies such as precipitation, adsorption, filtration, coagulation, just to name a few. This study opted for selective precipitation in the recovery of diametal composite from authentic acid mine drainage. Different studies have reported that aluminium and iron have strong affinity to chromium and the techniques thereof have been successfully employed. Hence, this study aimed to recover aluminium and iron as a dimetal composite from authentic acid mine drainage to remove chromium and Congo red dye from wastewater. Chromium is a heavy metal with prime states of plus 3 and plus 6, of which plus 6 is the most toxic. Ecotoxicological impacts associated with chromium have been reported to be teratogenic, carcinogenic, and mutagenic. On the other hand, Congo red dye is an anionic dye mostly used in textile, printing, and plastic industries, and its ecotoxicological impacts include the impairment of water quality as well as teratogenic, mutagenic, and carcinogenic. That is why it is important for these pollutants to be removed from water for the protection of the environment and human health. Some of the studies reported for chromium and Congo red dye removal include adsorption, filtration, biosorption, etc. This study focused on adsorption as the removal technique of chromium and Congo red dye from wastewater. This study was governed by the following aim and objectives, of which the overall aim was to recover and synthesize a dimetal composite from authentic acid mine drainage and explore its application in the removal of hexavalent chromium and Congo red dye from wastewater. In order to achieve the overall aim of the study, the authors had to come up with objectives of which the first one was to recover dimetal composites from raw acid mine drainage. The second objective was to employ different pretreatment techniques to enhance the reactivity of dimetal composite. The third objective was to optimize conditions that are suitable for the removal of chromium and Congo red dye using the synthesized dimetal composite. The fourth one was to characterize the dimetal composite before and after adsorption. The fifth one was to compare the product water quality at optimized conditions with the World Health Organization water quality standards. In order to achieve the outlined aim and objectives, the following materials and methods were used. Iron rich AMD was collected from a coal mine in South Africa. Chromium 6 and Congo red dye solutions were simulated for optimization experiments. The dimetal composite was recovered and synthesized via selective precipitation. For the adsorption of chromium-6 and Congo red dye, a batch experimental approach was adopted where concentration, pH, agitation, time, temperature, and dosage were optimized. FTIR, SAM, EDX, TGA, and BET were used for the characterization of a dimetal composite before and after adsorption. As reflected in the table, AMD characterization results showed that the raw AMD is rich in iron, aluminum, manganese, and sulfates, and this made it viable for the recovery of iron and aluminum dimetal composites. 
SEM and EDX EDS show the surface morphology and the elemental composition of the recovered and synthesized dimetal composite, respectively. From the elemental composition, we see the presence of iron and aluminium recovered from raw acid mine drainage. The FTIR shows the functional groups that are in the composite, and we see the presence of hydroxyl group and water. The BET shows the surface area and porosity of the compound. The BET shows the surface area and porosity of the composite, where we see that the surface area of the material is 24.62 square meters per gram, while the TGA gives the stability in the thermal sense of the material. Optimization results of adsorption revealed that 50 milligrams per liter of chromium concentration was found as the maximum concentration that the material could have. Electrochemical um, supercapacitors can be divided into two types, that is electric double layer capacitors and pseudo capacitors. Yeah, electrostatic uh, electric double layer capacitors uh, works on the principle uh, of uh, the charge separations uh, in Hellman double layer at the interface between the surface of the electrode and electrolyte. Uh, generally, carbon-based materials are used as the electrode materials for EDLCs. And uh, next is the electrochemical pseudocapacitors. These generally use metal oxide and conductive polymers as the uh, electrode materials. Uh, this uh, generally uh, pseudocapacitance is achieved by the Faradic electron charge transfer with redox reaction, intercalation, and electroption of the uh, electrolyte. Um, here in this um, uh, work, I present uh, I use magnesium dioxide as um, uh, the electrode uh, materials because of its very uh, cheap uh, natural abundance, uh, um, high theoretical capacitance, very low toxicity, and variable oxidation states uh, of 2, 3, 4, 5, and 7. The main interesting features in magnesium dioxide is its variable oxidation states and uh, it can exist in different crystalline phases uh, that is alpha, beta, gamma, and delta phase. Uh, here in this experiment I have used to uh, uh, used alpha MnO2, alpha magnesium dioxide for the electron materials because of its unique structure um, uh, that has uh, it has the 2 into 2 tunnel and uh, 1 into 1 tunnel. Uh, the 2 into 2 tunnel present in this uh, alpha MnO2 that helps to um, uh, easy electron uh, transfer uh, during the charge and discharge process. And um, it is uh, um, it has the stab stable in nature also. Uh, the main objectives of this work is to prepare the novel nanostructure of magnesium dioxide uh, with high uh, surface areas and uh, short iron diffusion paths for better electrochemical performance. To provide uh, the novel and green synthesis route with uh, utilizing toxic and hazardous without utilizing the toxic and hazardous agents. Uh, to make synthesis method less pricey and time consuming. Here, uh, the, this process uh, for this is the process for the synthesis of the um, uh, polyaniline silver and magnesium dioxide nanorod. Here, the magnesium uh, dioxide is firstly prepared by uh, the hydrothermal uh, treatment of potassium permanganate and concentrated hydrochloric acids. Uh, after being uh, hydrothermally treated uh, at 140 degrees Celsius for 12 hours. After that, the, um, the nanorod is treated. Uh, it is um, the silver nanoparticle is deposited by the photodeposition process um, um, in and finally uh, the last stage in the last step the um, uh, silver deposited magnesium dioxide nanorod is uh, it's coated it is wrapped by the polyaniline uh, by the oxidative polymerization method uh, and uh, the following reaction takes place uh, during the uh, Re, um, um, process of uh, synthesis of this uh, ternary composite. Here is uh, the figure uh, shows the TIM uh, transmission electron microscopy images of these uh, materials. Uh, the first image shows the, uh, the 
manganese dioxide nanorod is in um, uh, formation of the manganese dioxide nanorods after that the silver particles are also been appear on the uh, over ion batteries are also used in smart devices like smart watches and earphones and also use it in large capacity energy storage devices such as uh, electric car vehicles evs and energy storage system ESS due to high energy density. Uh, lithium ion batteries consist of four light figure. Uh, first uh, cathode. Cathode determines the performance of the lithium ion batteries. Second is anode. Anode stored lithium ion. And third is separator. Separator is for separating the node and cathode physically and passing lithium ion between those. A final component is electrolyte. Electrolyte probe pathway for lithium ions. Uh, in the charge discharge process uh, is operating by the redox reaction, such as the right formal formula. However, lithium ion batteries have great risk of explosion. Recently, a fire has occurred in large capacity lithium ion batteries uh, such as EVs and ESS. Uh, then, and a smartphone is also have uh, some prob uh, explosion problem and safety problem. In this situation, Electrolyte problems of lithium ion batteries is big issue. In the case of lithium ion batteries, uh, liquid electrolytes are used. In the case of li liquid electrolytes, the fluidity of ion and the uh, interface contacts are excellent. But uh, because liquid electrolyte use an organic solvent, uh, it is easily fired, and when the temperature rises, volume expansion occurs, and there is a risk of explosion. In addition, uh, liquid electrolytes cause side re reactions on the surface of the active material, forming an unintended SEI layer. And SEI layer creates poor battery performance. And liquid electrolytes are decomposed at high voltage and have limitation to manufacture vari various shapes of batteries because uh, it is liquid. Uh, in order to solve this, these problems, uh, solid electrolytes are being continuously researched and this presentation is also for researching solid electrolytes. The figure on the left is requirement of solid electrolyte. Basically, in order to operate as an electrolyte, it must have high ionic conductivity and be electrochemically and chemically stable. Uh, it should also have strong physical stability against fire and pressure. In the case of a uh, solid electrolyte, the interface between the electrode and the electrolyte is contacted with solid interfaces. Solid state method was used. First, NCA is ground so that it can be evenly mixed with the biomaterial, which is a coating source of nitrogen doped carbon. And then, calcination is performed at 500 degrees to obtain nitrogen doped carbon coating layer from the NCA. From now on, the NCA on which the nitrogen doped carbon coating layer is formed will be called as a NC.NCA. In order to compare the structural properties of bare NCA and NC.NCA, the XRD analysis was firstly measured. As a result of confirming the XRD pattern between bare NCA 
and NC.NCA, it was confirmed that the nitrogen dope carbon coating layer did not affect the structure change of the NCA as the XID peak was the same except for a very small peak difference. And for checking valence states of the elements of NC.NCA, XPS analysis is performed. Through the XPS data of NC.NCA, the peak of nickel, cobalt, aluminum, and oxide of the existing NCA were confirmed. And in addition, it was confirmed that the carbon and nitrogen peak, so through this result, it can be said that nitrogen dope carbon coating layer was formed on the NCA surface. And despite the formation of the coating layer, the nickel, cobalt, aluminum, and oxide peaks do not change. So the nitrogen dope carbon coating layer does not significantly affect the composition of NCA. In addition, the two peaks appearing in the nitrogen peak are pyridinic nitrogen and graphitic nitrogen nitrogen respectively from the left and between them pyridinic nitrogen has an advantage in improving the element electrochemical performance of the active material so therefore it can be said that the electrochemical performance of nc.nca in which pyridinic nitrogen is formed has improved Next, it was measured through HRFSM to confirm the morphological change of the samples. As a result, in the case of bare NCA, the surface was rough and fine particles were not found. But in the case of NC.NCA, the surface was smooth and fine particles were found on the surface. Through this, it was confirmed that a change appeared on the NCA surface by forming a coating layer. In addition, as a result of confirming the elemental composition of NC.NCA through its mapping, it can be confirmed that the nitrogen dope carbon coating layer was formed on the NCA through the fact that carbon and nitrogen appeared in addition to nickel, cobalt, aluminum, and oxide of NCA. Next, in order to confirm the difference in electrochemical performance between bare NCA and NC.NCA, the active material is mixed with 10 weight percent of PVDF as a binder and 10 weight percent of Denka Black as a conductive agent, and after mixing them, NMP is added to form a slurry. After that, laminating is performed on the current. The main uh, drawback is the alloying. The expansion is up to 400% when it alloys with lithium. So that is a very a big drawback. The One of the, the possible solutions for this is the use of porous silicon. And that looks like this. The normal silicon particle, when it uh, expands, it will crack and it will uh, go to fracture. But in a porous uh, situation, you get uh, by litiation, you get this, uh, this expansion is absorbed by uh, the pores in the material. And then yeah, you can have a certain capacity without any uh, volume change. So interesting is how much is that? First of all, the, we use porous milk uh, material from the company Imagi. They have a base material and that is a product in, in a wafer form called flakes. It has a porosity of 35% and a pore size of 200 to 600 nanometer. And it has a very flat, flat surface. So that makes it ideal for analysis with the uh, atomic force microscope. But as prepared for anodes, they uh, mill it to a, a very uh, yes, to particles between four and six micrometers, and then you can prepare anodes with eighty percent of this porous silicon, and uh, we tested that to thousand milliamperes per gram, and a capacity of hundred plus cycles, at a, uh, um, a C rate of zero point twenty five C, and that is based on this thousand, so this the C is based on thousand. 
So the anodes we use for this uh, uh, positron measurements. I show you here how we uh, how we uh, the, the the procedure we used for the positron measurements. First step, we do a uh, formatation of the material that is normal for every uh, start when you start with materials in in batteries. You do a fermentation step of 0.1 C. Then we do 10 cycles at 0.25 C. Then one cycle to go back to the same situation for every every uh, material we use and then we want to extract all the lithium out of the material and in these last steps you see this here to bring it to uh, uh, one volt against a lithium lithium um, the measurements i show with a positron annihilation the first will contain this whole procedure and the last will only have the format stepping and this part well, this is an atomic force microscopy scan from the pristine material. You see here the, the, the pores in the material clearly in this material. Um, and when we lithiate this material to a, uh, a, a rate above 2000 milliamps per gram, and that we know that because we are sure that we reach above this, but we are not sure because of the forming of this solid electrolyte interface that costs also lithium. So we are not sure exactly what, what the value is, but we know that it is higher than 2000. And then you see that the pores are closed or pores and material is more roughly on the surface. So that means the pores are uh, able to, uh, to absorb all kind of uh, expansion. Here you see a topo scan of the material again, and we did a spreading resistance scan with atomic force microscopy. Both and large scale and storage system, the demand for rechargeable batteries has grown explosively. Therefore, the development of advanced lithium ion batteries with improved energy density has been proposed to meet the increasing energy demand. Nickel-rich compounds such as layered MCM are regarded as a potential cathode material for lithium-ion batteries due to their low wall cost and relatively high capacity than LCO. However, large amounts of nickel in the cathode material result in structural and thermal instabilities. To address the aforementioned issues, we report the effect of surface coating of nickel-rich layered cathode material with nitrogen of carbon derived from calixten, which is a low-cost biomass material. Surface modification can improve battery performance by forming a physical chemical protective layer on the structure on the surface of the electrode material to prevent illusion of the electrode material into the electrolyte and suppress side reactions of electrode and electrolyte. The coating layer should have excellent ionic conductivity in order not to interfere the intercalation and the intercalation of lithium ions and chemical stability should be excellent in order to prevent reaction with active material and electrolyte. Nitrogen top carbon materials are more attractive because of its lower atomic radius and higher electronegativity than that of the carbon. Furthermore, the nitrogen atom incorporated graphitic network exhibit improved electrochemical performance. Generally, the incorporation of nitrogen atom into carbon skeleton is a vulnerable process which requires toxic chemical and creates environmental diffuse. On the other hand, synthesis of nitrogen of carbon from nitrogen-rich biomass as a carbonaceous 
Precoso has attracted great attention in recent years due to easy abandons, low cost, and economically viable methods. As a result, other components were removed through a series of processes and nitrogen the carbon source was obtained from garlic waste. The carbonization and sintering process have been adapted to prepare garlic waste drive nitrogen of carbon coated nickel rich NCM811 cathode material. Through the XPS and XRD data, it was confirmed that nitrogen of carbon formed the coating layer on the surface without affecting the crystal structure of NCM811. Garlic waste drive, drive nitrogen of carbon coated NCM811 material is expected to be able to show the lower capacity retention of NCM811 due to the formation. So I, I produced this alloy, then I set it to the step of rolling to the rolling process, followed by a heat treatment at 850 degrees Celsius, followed by the analysis. For the alloy of 6.9% weight titanium, I set it to the rolling process, followed by the heat treatment of 1100 plus uh, 1250 Celsius degrees, followed by the analysis. Analysis that are SMM, SNM, X-ray diffraction, and the magnetic analysis. This is the apparatus that I use for measuring the magnetic properties. It has a magnetic core in U-shape. The primary coil which, which will produce the applied magnetic field and the sample comes here. To measure the magnetic induction, it, uh, we vibrated a coil in the sample and to measure the magnetic restriction, we used a string gauges. The results and discussion part, I uh, will start, start talking about the SM results. The main difference between both alloys is at the grain size. We can see here that the, the grain size of the 6.9 titanium alloy is about 10 times larger than the 3% alloy. That is probably because of the difference between the temperature of the heat treatment. At this time, when I was studying the 3% alloy, uh, we are trying to obtain a, a normal grain growth and at this temperature of 850 it's at the dual phase region of the phase di diagram. Uh, at uh, 1100 degrees the 6.9 titanium alloy also is in the dual phase region, but at 1250 it's on the single phase region of the of the phase diagram. That's why we choose to make the, uh, the, the end of the heat treatment at this temperature to eliminate the secondary phase. Well, the X-ray diffraction show that in both alloys, the only phase that is present is the iron alpha. The difference between them is that the, for the 3% alloy, the most intense peak is relative to the plane 211, and the second most intense peak is relative to the 200 plane, while for the iron alpha pattern is the 110. The most intense peak is relative to the 110 plane. This can tell us that maybe a texture has been formed in this sample, while for the 6.9 sample it follows the, the pattern, it follows the pattern. And unfortunately, due, due to COVID situation, I wasn't able to do the EBSD for this sample, but it will be very interesting to analyze these results. 
Now about the B, the induction, magnetic induction versus magnetic field, the stress curve. Well, the 3% alloy has a higher value of the maximum magnetic field. Uh, confirmation about the zinc, the cobalt, and the selenium also confirmed, and the edax spectrum also confirmed the uh, material weight percentage and atomic weight percentage also. And uh, another advantage of uh, uh, in this uh, in this time, uh, we use a screen structure of zinc uh, and the cobalt how to last energy uh, in the uh, shell. Uh, energy shell and the uh, L, L shell and the L. 2,3 and L2,3 for cobalt and the zinc. Here I, I, I mistake for here. This one is the cobalt, this one is the zinc. So cobalt energy loss is around uh, 780 and the zinc uh, energy loss is 1040 uh, energy level, uh, energy electron volt. And the selenium also loss of electron is present for 1440, uh, I think. Uh, so, uh, selenium compound is mostly energy lost for uh, in this uh, comparison of uh, spinel structure of uh, oxide, spinel structure of sulfide, and spinel structure of selenide. So, uh, density of uh, state is high, that's why uh, electron loss is highly lost for selenium compound compared to oxide spinel, compared to uh, sulfide spinel, selenium is the highest electron loss. So, here uh, here, explain for elemental combo, uh, combustion of uh, zinc cobalt oxide, zinc cobalt sulfide, zinc cobalt selenide spaced spinel structure uh, with uh, supported and reduced to propane oxide for this one overall, uh, overall uh, elemental combustion of zinc cobalt oxide, sulfide, and selenium. Uh, here, uh, we, we clearly, uh, clearly uh, point out for uh, zinc, uh, cobalt, zinc uh, metal is. Uh, change the uh, uh, variation of oxide and the sulfide and the selenium uh, specific structure. And here, cobalt uh, element is uh, how to change the uh, anion of oxide, sulfur, and the selenium, how to change the structure and uh, uh, reaction condition also change the cobalt, uh, cobalt base only because cobalt is the active material in this uh, uh, spinal structure. Uh, then, here, carbon. Uh, when we use the uh, reduced graphene oxide to change the uh, anion for uh, oxygen and the sulfur and the selenium also change the structure and uh, modify uh, modify the uh, electron uh, negativity and the electron affinity also present here clearly uh, we explain so here another advantage of uh, analysis spectrum uh, analysis spectrum of x-ray absorption spectroscopy in cobalt kh the kh is uh, uh, energy energy cage of uh, uh, electrons energy last energy exchanged to uh, transfer to on a excited state so uh, we confirm the sinus spectrum and the excess spectrum of uh, zinc cobalt oxide spinel zinc cobalt sulfide spinel and zinc cobalt selenium uh, spinel structure uh, here confirmed uh, zinc is the uh, 2 plus oxidation state and uh, cobalt is the plus 3 oxidation state that's why uh, we confirm. Uh, we uh, definitely confirm the uh, this structure. Cobalt is uh, three plus state, and the uh, crystal stabilization energy also higher for cobalt uh, atom. Uh, so here, change the anions uh, spinel for oxide spinel is present this one. Uh, so uh, here confirm the cobalt oxide and the cobalt uh, cobalt metal um, coordination uh, coordination of uh, octahedral state. And the coordination of uh, zinc and the cobalt and the tetrahedral state is present. So, confirmed the uh, oxide structure. The reference used in uh, in my paper. So, oxide only confirmed the uh, this structure. And is how to change the uh, how to exchange the sulfur and how to exchange the selenium. What is the ch uh, present uh, change in this structure? So, here he clear uh, here clearly explained for the Tablet here, tablet is present. So, sulfide is uh, occupied uh, the structure. Uh, so, present uh, cobalt and the cobalt uh, after this uh, form. And here also confirmed the um, selenium compound of uh, cobalt is a cage. And then, 
confirm the zinc atom oxidation state and zinc atom donation number and zinc atom um, uh, um, crystal field stabilization energy also confirm by this pH, uh, zinc pH. So here you also present the zinc oxide, zinc oxide uh, structure and zinc cobalt uh, autocryptic stage and uh, zinc is the data. Third time going to the conductive MF properties. Here is the preparation process of hybrid membranes. The non-fiber membrane was prepared by electrospin method by blending organic linker with polyacrylonitrate solution. The MF were fabricated by a two-step hydrothermal reaction. The MF sheet layer was formed during the first hydrothermal reaction and MF crystals grew during the second hydrothermal reaction. After the two-step hydrothermal reaction, MF crystals were uniformly grown on the nanofibers and were not removed by rinsing, indicating that they were strongly bound to the nanofibers. MF seed layer growth process was important for growing uniform MF crystal. When synthesized on nanofibers without the seed growth process, the MF crystals grew non-uniformly on the nanofibers and were easily removed by rinsing. The two-step hydrothermal reaction on PAN nanofiber without organic linker also yielded weakly bound MF crystals with a non-uniform growth distribution. The effect of precursor concentration on the MF warpers was investigated. As the MF crystals grew on the nanofiber surfaces, the average diameter increased. In addition, increasing the precursor concentration increased the average size of the protruded crystals. Also, figure D shows the current voltage characteristics of hybrid membranes. The seed resistances of sample 1, 2, 3 were about 40 megaohm, 6 megaohm, and 2 megaohm per square respectively. Increasing the precursor concentration decreased the electrical resistance by increasing the thickness of the conductive MF. XRD and FTIR data also confirmed that MF crystals were successfully grown on PAN nanofibers. The optimized sample pressure drop was only slightly higher than pristine PAN membranes, indicating that hybrid membrane still has good flexibility. However, the pressure drop across sample with high concentration precursor was nearly twice that of optimized sample because unwanted MF clusters were cloaked on the pore of the nanofiber membrane. The filtration efficiency of hybrid membrane was compared with pristine membrane which has similar pressure drops. In the case of solid particles such as fine test dust, both membranes showed very good efficiency. But in the case of smoke PM, which is all type liquid drumlets, hybrid membrane showed much better filtration efficiency. SAM images of the smoke captured by pristine PAM membrane exhibited a series of axis symmetric drumlets, which are formed by adhered wetting liquid. But hybrid membrane exhibited no obvious axis symmetric drumlets. Instead, the material can highlights the regulation of interfacial and electronic synergy of highly efficient and durable supported catalysts for oxidation and reduction electrocatalytic applications. Also, in the resultant discussion part, the crystal orientation and carbon defect evaluation were evaluated by the famous XRD and Raman analysis. So, in the figure A and B, 
where the ultimate catalyst pt iridium copper cerium oxide doped on nitrogen sulfur graphene oxide possess the high crystallinity with parent and comparison materials and the graphene impact increasing gradually in the raman analysis structure of each materials further the surface characterization were evaluated by afm analysis the topography images of 2d and 3d shape clearly shows the surface study of pt iridium copper trimetals on graphene oxides additionally to gain the in depth insight into the structural and electronic characteristics of prepared nano composite interfaces were evaluated by fsm and ces tem analysis the images shows the single nano ball formation of trimetals over the graphene oxide and the both fsm and cs tem analysis the edx elemental mapping strongly supports the metal formation of ultra fine weight ratio preparation of pt iridium copper for example in the edx mapping fsm shows the average deposition of platinum iridium and copper were 10.55 percentages respectively as the same in the cs tem mapping it's also around 10 4.5 and 5 which strongly supports the ultra fine deposition of nanometals on the graphene sheets also the radical scavenging supporting material of semi broken ball shaped cerium oxide also evaluated using fsm analysis where the nanoparticles of cerium oxides are evenly distributed on the graphene sheets the average size of the cerium oxide nano balls are around 500 nanometer to 700 nanometer and in the case of pt iridium copper metal the average size of each metal is evenly in the statistics of amfc received the recent attention as a promising energy conversion system as it is more energy efficient it is more advantageous than conventional internal combustion engines moreover it doesn't emit pollutant and is less noisy however there is a problem with amfc when hydroxide ions are exposed to carbon dioxide bicarbonate is produced which decreases the pure cell performance also the durability of the polymer materials in alkaline environment is a big issue Let me expand more on the polymer materials for AMFC. As we know, both the membrane and the electrode ionomer are polymer materials, and they both conduct hydroxide ions. However, the membrane must have a low gas permeability and high mechanical strength, because gas applied from both sides of anode and cathode should not be crossed over. On the other hand, the electrode ionomers must have a high gas permeability for electrochemical reactions. Action, but it doesn't have to have high mechanical strength. Furthermore, these ionomers work as a binder to prevent the membrane and the electrode from falling apart, which makes the interfacial compatibility with the membrane important. As you can see, there is a growing trend in the research on polymer materials in the AMFC field to this day. 
to improve the alkaline stability and the hydroxide ion conductivity, researchers are studying various polymer structures by using different kinds of polymer backbone and cationic groups. So, what are some issues regarding polymer materials? One is the chemical degradation of the backbone in alkaline environment. The arylithyl group is used to increase the flexibility of the membrane, but it is vulnerable to hydroxide ion attack. In particular, it breaks more easily when there are electron withdrawing groups. So, polymers including the arylithyl structures such as polyisosulfone and polyphenylene oxide cannot last long enough. The other issue with polymer materials is about the electrode ionomer such as the exception of phenyl groups in the catalyst layer. The phenyl exception on platinum catalyst blocks the electrochemical active site and decreases the AMFC performance. Since most AMFCs use hydrocarbon polymers which contain the phenyl groups, this becomes a problem. So, this is what I'm working on. To address this issue, I chose a polystyrene backbone for the electrode ionomer. Polystyrene doesn't have the arylithyl structure and it consists of linear carbon-carbon bone which make it strong in alkaline environment. Although it is hard to apply the polystyrene as the membrane due to its weak mechanical properties, I use it as an electrode ionomer with alkyl ammonium on the benzyl group of it. So I made a new structure of ionomers with various molecular weights. And then I tried to check the effect of the structure on the electrode by controlling the alkyl side chain length of the ionomers. First, let's look at the overall synthesis mechanism of the new ionomer structures. The polymer backbone was synthesized by radical polymerization with benzene sulfonic chloride and styrene monomer. The radical polymerization is advantageous to control molecular weight, so I made various polymer molecular weights from 1 million to 6 million gram per mole. The next step I did is acylation and reduction reactions to obtain the functional group. During the acylation process, I control the side chain length according to the number of carbon of this acylation chemical. 5% of the Earth's water is saline water, like brine or seawater. And only 2.5% is the fresh water. As a result, there is an increasing demand on technologies that can desalinate seawater into fresh water that humans can drink. Various techniques, including reverse osmosis and multi-stage flash, have been developed, but they require huge energy. Solar steam generation (SSG) is a technology to produce desalinated steam from saline water using abundant solar energy. Especially, interfacial SSG (ISSG) localizes heat on solid air water interface so that it performs more efficient evaporation. For highly efficient ISSG, following properties are needed: high light absorbance and thermal insulation for energy efficiency, and faster water transport and large surface area for faster evaporation. And there is one more essential factor, and it is salt resistance. Conventional SSG is easily blocked its top surface by precipitated salt so that the, the energy conversion efficiency is reduced. First, treat G for salt resistant SSG is donut potential. Charged layer generates donut potential and rejects ions electrochemically. However, it demands nanopores and less durable. Second one is rigid redissolution of salt. Vertical microchannel or hydrophilic layer lowers the concentration of salt by effective water transport. So, it is permanent strategy. CO2 laser techniques are widely used for cutting or converting substrate materials. With the laser, sub substrates can be photothermally converted into grafting materials or just ablated. These techniques enable one-step process for patterning, graftization, and ablation. 
In this work, Hyot razor was used to fabricate light absorbing layer and grid grooves on wood. Grid grooves are expected to act as re-dissolution sites of salt for the salt resistance of SSG. Bassoot was first irradiated by short razor all over the top surface with lower power to fabricate right at serving layer by surface gravitation. Then grid groups were fabricated with higher laser power. The morphology of LIG wood was studied with SEM. A few 200 micrometer sized vertical microchannels are retained even after repeated laser irradiation. The microchannels can facilitate the water transport. LIGF wood has a smooth surface like best wood, and LIGG wood has grooves in a square grid. Raman spectroscopy and EDS show the chemical changes after laser irradiation. While only a broad background was observed for basswood, the character a nanostructured compact sits with the ceramic pillars embedded in the uh, polymer matrix. And uh, the schematic shows also the AFM probe used for probing the piece of local piezoelectric measurement, which is the aim of the research. We use here the lead-free piezoelectric uh, material NBT and the highly electroactive native polymer PVDFTRP for synthesis of these nanostructured composites. Sodium bismuth titanate introduced by the Smolensky in 1961 recently studied well for its room temperature ferroelectric properties. The room temperature crystal structure is a rhombohedral structure with R3C distortion and the ferroelectric order is driven by the bismuth driven uh, titanium distortion. The schematic shows the structure of uh, NBT crystal with uh, sodium and bismuth uh, occupying the corner of the crystal and titanium occupying the uh, octahedral void by the uh, oxygen. It exhibits good piezoelectric characteristics and the curie temperature is around 320 degrees Celsius which is good for using it for the uh, room temperature application. Introduction to the copolymer PVDF TRFE. Out of the five dif different crystal conformation of PVDF molecule, when added with the 20 to 60 percentage of TRFE, the molecular chains form all trans TTTT conformations without any mechanical stretching or electrical. Uh, the Curie temperature of the PVDF TRFE with the uh, addition of the TRFE molecule ranges from 137 degrees Celsius to 90 degrees Celsius. With the addition of 20 percentage of TRFE, uh, it will have a query temperature of 134 degrees Celsius, which is above the good room temperature. It has also high remanent polarization and uh, comparatively good piezoelectric coefficient, high thermal stability, and energy tra uh, transfer as well. This schematic uh, shows uh, the all trans conformation of the PVDF TRFE molecule. Coming to the experimental details, results and descriptions. Synthesis of uh, LNO layer as a substrate. We use RF magneton substrate deposition method to fabricate 200 nanometer of uh, LNO on top of the SiO2 SA substrate. Um, the XRD analysis shows 001 oriented growth without any impurity phase. Uh, the topography is shown here uh, with an RMS roughness of around 3.3 nanometer. Similarly, we fabricated B and T uh, on top of the LNO SAO2 SA substrate using the RF magnetron spectrum method. Uh, the XRD uh, analysis shows the 001 oriented of the uh, BNT uh, layer on top of the 001 oriented LNO layer, uh, also without any impurity phase. The AFN topography is uh, presented here uh, with an RMS roughness of around 5.8 nanometer. 
PFM domain imaging of the BMT thin films. Uh, the picture shows the topography corresponding out of plane amplitude and out of plane phase of the PFM domain imaging uh, on top of the BMT thin films. Here we can see that most of the grains are a single domain with uniform polarization. Also, some domains extend towards the adjacent grains. After uh, evidencing that the significant focusing our attention on this aspect and we could successfully convert the resistance modulation for identifying the gases present in the environment. The gas sensing aspect, there is a growing concern over environmental issues and its impact on ecosystem in the present day, in the present day world. In our daily life, we are exposed to different kinds of gases, whether it be in our domestic or industrial or public environment. Some of the gases are used for as fuel. They are explosive gases and highly inflammable and explosive. Some of the gases are used as re reagents and some of them are used as catalysts for the different kinds of industrial application. Some of the gases are highly toxic. Some of the byproducts of the gases and, and even the gases itself are causing greenhouse effect. Hence, it is highly imperative to test, to detect, control, and monitor the presence of the gases for the normal life and for the protection of our environment. Initially, metal oxide based on SNO2, ZNO, TaO2, WO3, etc., have been extensively studied for gas sensing application. Due to the growing demand from the industry, researchers diverted their attention to other type of materials. In that way, binary and ternary metal oxide came into the field. Our research area belongs to this class of materials. The highlight of our study is we have used very low concentration level of dust gases for gas sensing studies, and the, the material shows significantly high gas sensing response. The test gases used for the study are carbon monoxide and methane. Oxygen present in air is the oxidizer. When the material is exposed to the test gases, the resistance decreases to a minimum value and on exposure to the oxidizing gas, the resistance returns to the initial state. The response magnitude is defined as S is equal to R0 minus Rg divided by R0, where R0 and Rg are the resistance in air and test gas. This slide shows the synthesis procedure. It is self-explanatory, so I'm going to the next slide. It gives the, this gives the reaction followed in this uh, synthesis method. The final end product is the a dried precursor, which is heated at 400 degrees Celsius for three hours for its decomposition to form the ferrite as the powder. For better crystallinity, the, this material is sintered at 800 degrees Celsius and allowed to cool to normal temperature. The final powder is subjected to a different type of analysis. This is the powder refractogram of the sample. Each peaks are identified using Bragg's plane and it is compared with the standard reference. It is observed that the X-ray diffraction peak of uh, Fe3O4 agrees well with the observed pattern, and there is a minor presence of alpha Fe2O3 and NiO in the sample. The NR function plot is used for identifying the lattice parameter. WH method is used for determining the crystallite size. It is observed that particle size ranges from 29 to 50 nanometer depending upon the material of choice. The cation distribution of the material is determined using intensity analysis of the diffraction peak. The anthocyanin. Anthocyanin is the natural and non toxic treatment, and they can show the visible color in the white range, which nowadays they are uh, increasing the interest of the anthocyanin from the natural source, such as the raspberry from tomato, the sweet potato, and mostly anthocyanin for, for in our study is focused on the butterfly anthocyanin, which can change the color 
form the acid methyl and bed from the pH 1 to pH 12 according to the structures of the anthocyanin will change depending on the pH change. And butterfly pea anthocyanin is the plant form family peppers here is the commonly found in the two halves of the Southeast Asia and the have the light blue petal form the flower and have the rich of the anthocyanin. Uh, and in this study, this study target to evaluate the effect of the effect of butterfly pea and protein in which compound on the morphological structure, absorption, spectrum, and the colors of the pH sensitive intelligence indicator based on the hydroxy propyl methyl cellulose and microcrystalline cellulose. Or in our study, we divide in the two steps. The first one is the optimum concentration of the butterfly pea and protein. Firstly, butterfly pea will dry and flour, and then extract. One gram of butterfly pea uh, powder will extract by the 80% of ethanol attached by the PF, uh, attached PF by the hydrochloric acid. Then heat for 50 degrees Celsius for one hour, and 24 we will get the extract solution from the butterfly pea, then evaporate in the evaporator. After evaporator, the concentration it will increase, and then we will bring to dry with the this night to get the butterfly pea anthocyanin powder, and then the powder were analyzed in terms of the total anthocyanin content, the optimum concentration of butterfly pea, uh, UV risk flow, and the sensitivity to ammonia. From this step, we will get the optimum concentration of butterfly pea anthocyanin for using the next step. To, uh, Hydroxy propylmetry cellulose and microbicillin cellulose to microcomposite the pin as a pin there for indicator. 16 grams of HDMC mixed with 4 grams of MTC and drained with uh, the eye water, homogenized at 10,000 RPM and heat at 30 degrees Celsius for one hour. After that, reduce the temperature to 50 degrees Celsius for one hour and then add the anthocyanin solution. After that, stony care. Sony cap to remove the bubble and 40, uh, 40 milliliter cap on the spread polystyrene petty dish. Then dry at 40 degrees Celsius for 24 hours, and then we will get the indicator for uh, MCC, HPMC, MCC, butterfly tea, and protein. Then indicator what in the life the property, same, and FDR and sensitivity to the energy. This picture, you can see the, uh, the color change of the butterfly pea and protein solution in the wireless pH. In the left picture, you can see the change of butterfly pea and protein, and it's clear the colors of the butterfly pea and protein were changed. Uh, the color from pink to yellow from the 1 to 12. And also in the right side of the picture is the absorption of the butterfly pea and protein solution in the wireless pH. This and the bacteria should be investigated. However, early study on GNTRC mostly focused on the material characterization, and so and analytical study using classical laminated plate theory or post oversea deformation theory. In this context, the purpose of this study is to develop or numerical method using mesh free method, you know the mesh free method, which is different from the usual finite element method. And I using, I extend the mesh free method for the natural element method to the structural and modal analysis of the CNTRC plate. The bottom three pictures shows the uh, vibration mode, first mode, and the second and the third mode of CNTRC plate. Now, uh, CNTRC plate shown here, that uh, is where the CNT is uniformly distributed, that indicates the C each uh, CNT, and the light shows the functionally graded CNTRC plate. The top is very uh, and the Delta is FGO, bottom is FGX. And the volume fraction through the thickness is 
uh, is placed by the function of volume fraction play star and the particular coordinate g. And here, mass fraction play star is uh, expressed by the density of uh, rho CMT and the rho like this uh, found. Because CNT and the matrix is combined in CNT acid uh, plate, the gradation of equivalent material properties is very important. So that usually molecular dynamic simulation and the load of mixtures are combined so that we can uh, obtain equivalent material E1 and the shear modulus G1 to Poisson's ratio U1 to and the density low. Here, Delta 1, eta 2, eta 3 indicate the scale dependence parameter, and which is in function of uh, volume pressure per star. Table 1 shows the three different cases, eta 1 and eta 2, eta 3, for different, three different volume pressures. And the eta is also predicted by making use of molecular dynamic simulation and durable mixture found in. Next slide is uh, briefly uh, into this mesh-free method. Uh, mesh-free method is, uh, was uh, introduced to overcome the merit of a standard finite element method. Representatives are uh, EFGM, RKGM, Cloud, QM, NFTG, etc. However, this conventional mesh-free method has two uh, disadvantages. One is a difficulty in numerical integration using the standard Gaussian integration point, the second one treatment of essential boundary condition. To overcome this difficulty, natural element method has been introduced in 1995. And the major advantage of this method is the easy uh, implementation of essential boundary condition and the easy numerical integration. So there, this method has been widely and extensively used in solid and the dynamics problem in engineering and the science field. Now, and this slide is not very uh, complex in this. So whatever, it can only know the external size of the nano cage. How to get the internal size of a nano cage? People, of course, grow crystal or use the NMR to detect water inside the cavity. Oh, of course, here, another example, use infrared spectroscopy. So those things are hard to do. Is there any way we can do it fast and straightforward? There is, I think, as the foster resonance energy transfer, FRED. So use FRED, they can sense the nanometer scale dimensions while keeping the target intact. If we do FRED, we need a, a donor. So they can absorb a photon and go from ground state to excess state. Yeah, possibly they can emit another photon, come to ground state again. But before it come back to ground state, if there's another molecule, for example, acceptor approach it, so the energy will transfer from the downer to the acceptor. Okay. This energy transfer efficiency depends on distance. With farther distance, the transfer efficiency is low, but the even shorter distance, the efficiency is high. So from this transfer efficiency, we can know the distance between the downer and the acceptor. Here we use silver nanodots. What are silver nanodots? Actually, they are stable luminescent silver clusters, but they have to be protected by some partition group, for example, polymer PAA, or peptides, or single-stranded DNA. Why we like it? Because they have wide spectral range from the blue to near IR. They are also very stable, for the stable here, also bright. The left one is from single molecule of the silver dots, and the right is from Texas right. When Texas right is quenched thin, the silver dots are still bright, stable. 
The other property we like it because the silver nanotubes have very large to photon absorption cross section. So we can use the silver nanotubes to detect the nanocage in protein. <laughs> but before we do that, we can find the model as the reverse myself. Reverse myself is the water in oil, right? So they are separate by this surfactant. Okay. The water nanocage over here of the reverse myself resemble the polar pockets in enzyme people use as model. But to understand those water poles, actually people understand the whole uh, particle, right? The reverse myself by DRS. All people want to get something inside this optical sensor to uh, sense the viscosity of this water phase. But it's not directly. Well, when people study this one, people also found something not so consistent. So one thing people think, right, so when you add more water into the uh, reverse cell, suppose the size of the nano cage will increase. But in this paper, they mentioned that as you increase the water content, the size of the nano cage first increase and then shrink again. But of course, some people say, Oh, it will increase continuously. Conjugated magnetic nanoparticles of sensitive and selective detection can be achieved. After magnetic separation of target bacteria, uh, the bacteria concentration can be determined by using a size searching method or using some using uh, by a sandwich assay using probes. However, using additional probes for sandwich assay is a time consuming and expensive process. Therefore, the size searching method is preferred for the screening purposes. Conventional size searching method use membrane filters to separate the bacteria magnetic nanoparticle complexes from small free magnetic nanoparticles. Use membrane filters and the magnetic nanoparticles uh, offers an easy and cost effective way for the detection of the food bomb bacteria. However, it has a critical drawback. The solution drilled on the membrane filters flow down and spread laterally, so it increases the contact area with the solution. Therefore, it degrades the sensitivity. To solve this problem, some researchers use fine nozzle or make surface hydrophobic. However, using a fine nozzle increases the analyst time or hydrophobic coating increases the non-specific binding. Therefore, in this study, we overcame this limitation by using a lateral flow filters. The pastry was prepared simply by uh, overlapping an absorbent part on the NC membrane. Then the NC membrane was pressed to generate the control line with considerably small pores compared to the initial membrane. The size of the gold coated the free gold coated magnetic nanoparticle cluster is about 180 nanometer. After combining with equali, the size of the gold coated MNC's bacteria complexes became one micrometer. Antibody conjugated magnetic nanoparticle clusters were incubated in 50 milliliter of the milk, and these complexes were separate were magnetically separated and then this person 200 micro, microliter of the phosphate buffer. The immersion of the test strip, uh, immersion of the test strip on the solution containing a free gold coated MSCs and the gold coated MSCs bacteria complexes induce the color change. The, gold coated, the free gold coated MSCs move off through the test strip and accumulated at the control line. In contrast, the where the coated MSC bacteria complexes accumulated at the lens cost and it made the test line. Interestingly, the most world coated MSC bacteria complexes accumulated at the at the lens cost and rarely accumulated below the lens cost. This is because the sample solution flow toward the lens cost of the NC membrane and the flow velocity which maximum at the lens cost. As you can see in this picture, the line shape was change depending on the width of the test strip. The meniscus more curved and dark when the width increases. The two 
Since the 2 millimeter wide test strip was not convenient to use, the 3 millimeter wide test strip was selected as optional membrane. As you can see in this picture, the, dark, the main spots more, the main became darker as the echoa increases. This is because the number of the gold coated MSS bacteria complexes increases as the echoa increases. In contrast, the control line became paler as the echoa increases. This is because the number of the gray gold coated MSS. There is, however, an increasing problem of price of the lithium ion battery as the current lithium reserves are mainly inaccessible due to some geopolitical factors. Hence, the prices of lithium salts for synthesis have increased rapidly. This figure shows the price difference between the lithium carbonate and sodium carbonate, both salts that are used for the synthesis of the cathode material and their price differences. As you can see, there is the price of the sodium is 30 times cheaper than that of the lithium salt. In terms of materials used in sodium ion batteries, the following figure shows both the cathode and the anodes used in the sodium ion batteries. Most of the cathodes are polyionic compounds as well as oxides, both the layered O3 and layered P2. In this, our material we are going to discuss on is na 2 fep 7 and we are going to try lithium cell solution on it. On the anode side, there is carbonaceous material, car, uh, materials that have carbon in it, non graphitic carbon, uh, graphene, and then there is also metal oxides and metal, metal sulfides. There have also been organic anodes and metal alloy anodes. However, the metal anoy, anodes are more recent as compared to both carbonaceous and the metal oxide and metal sulfide anodes. Even though the sodium ion battery technology shows promising results, it has its own challenges as well. One of them is lower operating voltage. Comparatively to the lithium ion, which operates at 4.9 volts, the sodium ion battery technology has a lower operating voltage. It shows inferior reversible capacity and lower energy density as compared to lithium ion batteries as well. And one of the other main reasons is it requires high temperature for optimal work. This, is, this causes a lot of safety issues, lifespan issues and cost issues. What we are aiming for are batteries that have high specific energy, high specific perfor performance and high specific power. Towards addressing the challenges of the sodium ion battery, various groups have reported different solutions for this problem, a few of which have been listed here. Dimension reduction, which decreases the diffusion distance of the ions. Composite formation, where conductive materials like graphene and carbon nanotubes are used to enhance conductivity. Doping, where trace amounts of transition metals are used to improve the chemistry, the chemical and thermal stability. Morphology control to improve structural stability. Coatings to protect from electrolyte electrode in contact and to prevent unwanted side reactions. And finally, electrolyte modification to form protective passivation layer on the electrodes. As a solution to address one of the problems of the sodium ion battery challenges, we proposed use of lithium substitution. The lithium substitution has been previously promoted by many groups uh, wherein small trace amounts of lithium is substituted instead of sodium in the alkali metal layer. Here this figure shows the dual stabilization of effect of lithium addition in O3 type sodium based oxide cathodes. The reported work shows that there is a bulk stabilization where the crystal structure of the material is stabilized by property in comparison with silicon. SIC has many crystal forms called polytypes. This picture uh, shows an optical image of uh, OH6H15R SIC region uh, separated by different colors. 
the color of a 6H, 4H, 15R is green, brown, yellowish brown, uh, respectively. H means the hexagonal form, R means the uh, rhombohedral form. SIC is uh, also com uh, covalent network compound. Uh, silicon is bonded to four carbons, and the carbon is uh, bonded to four silicons. This atomic arrangement of SI and C pair, parallel to the uh, gross axis, C axis, uh, resulting significant different electrical and physical property. Understanding of surface conditions, defect, such as defect, contamination, and surface polarity, and so on, including wetting property of SI's polytype, is very important to ensure performance and characteristic of resulting SIC-based devices. SIC is polar crystal, has a two different surface structure of silicon terminated silicon phase and C terminated C phase. And water is also polar substance and room temperature and has a higher liquid surface tension compared to the other liquid. In the case of SIC, the surface polarity typically identified dry and wet summer oxidations at high temperature using different in oxidation rate of silicon phase and C phase. Okay, this video shows a very simple concept of the interaction between polar substrate and polar materials. Uh, let's see what happened when an electrical charged glass bar reached to a uh, dry water droplet. Uh, we selected a uh, PVT grown as such a sample uh, with a mixture of 4H and 6H and 15R SI resin separated by a different color. Side view image of the uh, uh, water drop lab on SI substrate obtained by contact angle measurement system and analyzed uh, by image analysis software called Pigman at Wakefield Masters. For polytype identification, uh, backscattering Raman scattering measurement was done at uh, room temperature under microscope. And in order to uh, investigate uh, the effect of native oxide uh, layer on the contact angle, static contact angle on different polytype region of SI substrate was measured before and after native oxide removal uh, using POE solution. Uh, after, uh, uh, sorry, a series of additional contact angle measurements was done for monitoring the effect of native oxide growth on the contact angle of the 24 hours after the POE uh, treatment. Okay, this picture shows a side view of a, a water droplet on SI substrate. This is Fingman. We first uh, setting a reference uh, scale and uh, drawing. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Byung Sung Moon. I'm a postdoc in Sungjungwan University. Today, what I'm going to talk about is green up conversion enhancement achieved by laser induced transformation from beta sodium ethyl fluoride to yttria. A conversion luminescence is a unique optical process that converts low energy photons into a higher energy photon, unlike conventional luminescence that converts high energy photon into lower energy photon. A conversion luminescence is facilitated by lanthanide trivalent ions because it has ladder like energy structures and long lived intermediate state to realize easy multi photon absorption. So when we illuminate near infrared light, NIR light on accommodative materials, we can see visible light from accommodative materials as a result of accommodation. Accommodation has created many fascinating applications in diverse research fields because of its unique use of NIR 
as a life source. For example, solar energy harvesting, security patterns, latent fingerprinting for zero background forensics. And because NIR can penetrate tissue deeper than visible light, accommodated materials has demonstrated deep tissue optogenetics. This is big, uh, important because in conventional optogenetics, we have to open scores or tissues to realize optogenetic effects. But using accommodated materials, we don't have to open scores or tissues. In a conversion, there are two popular host materials. First one is sodium ethyl fluoride, and second one is yttria. For brightness, sodium ethyl fluoride is the best choice because its low local symmetry can facilitate the breakdown of La Protection rule, that is the main restriction of accommodation efficiency. However, peak sharpness and thermal stability of sodium ethyl fluoride is inferior to yttria. So <clears throat> silicon-based optoelectronics, which is the potential application of a conversion, which requires high temperature annealing process above 800 degrees Celsius, uh, sodium ethyl fluoride is unsuitable for these applications. Therefore, if we can make bright yttria-based accommodation materials, it would be great for next generation silicon-based optoelectronics. Before, before we see short video of experiment, I will explain the detail of experimental method. We prepared sodium ethyl fluoride microplate, which is singly dubbed with albium 0.5% to realize green or composite emission. The microplate was placed on nickel substrate and irradiated by highly focused laser beam. So, uh, sorry. When we irradiate moderate power, we can see typical emission spectrum <clears throat> Professor Ongchulman, it's great honor to introduce my research in this seminar. I appreciate the committee and the chair. Uh, today, my topic is non-volatile, ultra-structural, and ionic sensory platforms for next generation wearable flat electronics. I'd like to start by looking at this exponential growth of wearable electronics, referred to as E-schemes. E-schemes are the flexible, stretchable, and self-healing electronic materials that can mimic the functionalities of human or animal skin. The broad class of materials containing sensing abilities that are able to introduce to response the environmental factors such as changes in temperature, humidity, and pressure. Therefore, there have been many efforts to develop the high sensitive strength sensor, such as carbon material-based textile, or liquid metal or encapsulating ion liquid into the elastomer. And moreover, the hydrogel and ion gels are the growing fascinating materials that are used to strain sensor due to their highly flexibility and highly transparency. However, there are also many defects to develop the strain sensor because the complicated fabrication process and the agglomeration problems of con conductors are problems due to their discontinuity of the reversibility and uh, long-term durability. And moreover, the hydrogel-based strain sensor have a serious problems to develop, to, to maintain the sensitivity because the drying issues of water. Therefore, they need an additional process such as encapsulation process, or they need to add some humectants to prevent the water drying. And moreover, the conductor-based the conductor elastomer strain sensor are limit, have a limit range to endure the applied strain. Therefore, in this study, we focused on the ion gel systems. The ion gel are consist of copolymer and ion liquid. We approach the designing process of molecular, molecular structure of copolymer because the gel performance, such as 
characterization of mechanical strengths are strongly dependent on the copolymer generators. So we made the PMML and non PBA copolymer by simply using the Laput polymerization method. By, P by simply mixing the copolymer and ion liquid, the physical cross linked ion gel are produced. And this PMML and non PBA copolymer shows highly stretchable stretchability more than 850%. To figure out this highly good stretchability, we also synthesized PMMA home polymer and PMA home polymer, which has high grass strength temperature and low grass strength temperature than PMMA and PBA copolymer. Uh, some studies argue that the low grass strength temperature is a crucial factor for chain flexibility. Therefore, we simply tested the three types of ion gels. Uh, look at this gas data and stress stress curve shows that the low grass strength temperature is significantly affect the chain flexibility. However, the not significantly affect the ultra stretchability. Yeah. Therefore we um, therefore we look at these microscopic images. Uh, look at these images shows that the PMMA whole polymer ion gel and PMMA random PBA copolymer based ion gel shows good mixed system, but not PBA based ion gel. And moreover, the small angle X-ray scattering data shows that uh, we, uh, we uh, extract the agglomeration size of this data by using the simple linear polar resume. This, day, this two data shows that the PMMA random PBA based ion gel has a larger agglomeration than PMMA whole polymer based ion gel. Putting it all together, the PBA domain is not dissolved in ionic liquid. Therefore, we conclude that the low grass transient temperature and ionic insoluble domain are a crucial factor for chain flexibility. To verify our assumption, we also synthesized PMMA random PS copolymer which has ion liquid insoluble domain as PS styrene domain. And if this is higher grass transient temperature than PBA domain. Therefore, in these two data sh also shows that the PMA random PS copolymer based ion gel could be stretched more than 500. About to talk about our recent work. This uh, new version of the non-migratory uh, active packaging uh, in the, in the uh, contribution. We will talk about the migratory and non-migratory. Uh, the, the, the perception about the packaging is mostly about the primary properties, like a, some kind of protection or uh, some kind of uh, structure for deliver the product. But the, in the, the new generation of the packaging, we have a active packaging. Active packaging definition is intentionally in addition of the, some active material that active materials can give some active function like antimicrobial, antioxidant, or some kind of scavenging for the packaging. The conventional packaging materials in the market, they are just, uh, it, it's, a it's a type of the mechanical or barrier uh, materials. But the, those packaging, in, packaging system in the market, they cannot protect about the shelf life. But the active packaging, uh, can enhance and extend the shelf life of the product. So, uh, but uh, the, the, the recent work in the active packaging is mostly about the migratory uh, packaging. It means when we look at the biomedical or the food items, they have a synthetic antioxidant and so sometimes they use a some bio bio based or originally from a bio resources uh, used as a antioxidant, uh, but all of them needs to migrate or need to be dissolved in the pro uh, product. So they have a diverse of the problems. The most important one is the when we use a, uh, when we take for a long long terms of the usage of the some kind of the. Uh, synthetic materials or some kind of the uh, bio-based materials, they have uh, some health challenge for human. And even they don't have health challenge, but when they migrate to the products, they will change the sensory product. And in 
the, the way these states, they are using the um, active packaging, they incorporate the active materials into the, the polymer or the packaging. So those materials can change the primary pr pr performance of the packaging, like a barrier or, uh, or uh, mechanical or uh, barrier properties. So they interfere in the packaging uh, performance. In our work, we was intended to develop a non-migratory antioxidant packaging. Uh, the antioxidant needs to do three important uh, works or ac action. The first one is they need to scavenge a free radical in the system, collate the transition metals, and quench the, those reactive species, free radical or, uh, or peroxidants. Uh, in this work, we use the paraanacidine. Paraanacidine is a kind of the conducting polymer. In the engineer, they use as a conducting polymer. But in here, we was intend we were intended to uh, use these materials uh, as an antioxidant. The technology we use for this work was about the photographing mechanism. The the we uh, we grafted photochemically monomer on the surface of the film. Our film is polypropylene. Uh, we uh, exposed our uh, uh, polymer to this coating solution. Coating solution is containing uh, some kind of the monomer uh, in the presence of the photo initiator. Mostly for the surface uh, uh, photographing, benzophenin is a common uh, photo initiator. When we, uh, as you can see in the uh, slide, if uh, our monomer is a glycidyl methacrylate, we can brush the surface, means photochemically uh, brush the surface, and we have a large amount of the oxyron ring. This oxyron ring is uh, versatile, so can react with uh, functional materials and hold the functional materials through a covalent banding. The covalent banding is sufficiently strong to hold the materials on the surface of the uh, packaging. The work we will use, the first we uh, clean up the uh, resin using gas. Uh, Firstly, I'd like to thank Committee of Advances in Functional Materials 2021 for accepting our work. I am Labad Madani. I am a PhD student in Biskra University from Algeria. I am working on wide and ultra-wide band gap semiconductors devices. In this presentation, I will present part of our research, which is cited on control of Schottky barrier height of nickel with a gallium oxide, Schottky barrier diode, the insertion of a graphene monolayer. This work prepared by me, Labad Madani, Professor Nadine Sanguga and Professor Afak Murtjah from Bistra University and Professor Istran Grim from Sijong University. Initial studies on gallium oxide were performed in 60s of the 20th century, but then it was almost forgotten for about three decades. An intensive, an intensive research in physics, devices, and applications of gallium oxide in the last, dec last decades placed that compound in front line of an ultra-wide band gap semiconductors development. The excellent intrinsic properties of this material include an ultra-wide band gap of about 4.8 4 electron volt, high electrical breakdown field, and high 
electro high electron saturation velocity combined with availability of large scale production from mines. In addition to its low cost, compared with silicon carbide and gallium nitride. Gallium oxide has six polymorphs, but beta polymorph is the most stable. However, gallium oxide has serious drawback of developing P-type semiconductor. Therefore, it is used mostly in unipolar devices such as MOSFET and Chutki barrier diode. In last years, the number of gallium oxide, Chotsky barrier diode related academic publications has, has substantially increased and, res and uh, researchers aimed from these publications to developing a high performance Chotsky barrier diode with for example, low serial resistance low threshold voltage to minimize heating during operation, low leakage current, and high thermal stability, and finally controllable Schutzke barrier height. According to Schutzke mode rule, a linear dependence between Schutzke barrier height and metal work function. However, measured Schutzke barrier height is not related to the metal work function as predicted as predicted by Schutzke much rule. Farzana and co-workers, Yao and co-workers studied effect of metal work function on Schutzke barrier height variations of an insulator between metal and gallium oxide. Bhata Hasharia and co-workers proposed deposition of silicon dioxide in interface between metal and gallium oxide. Then effect of metals on Chotsky barrier height variations are studied. For example, Chotsky barrier height for nickel is higher, the, uh, is higher than that for platinum, although the platinum work function is higher. So Chutsky barrier height values are not predictable. Another solution proposed by Harada and co-workers, they proposed deposition, deposition of flyer of flyer in interface between metal and gallium oxide. This layer consists of a mixture of palladium and cobalt oxide. As, as presented in figure three. And as presented in figure four, Schutzke barrier height increases with interlayer thickness. In this work, a proposition based on insertion of a graphene monolayer between nickel and silicon doped gallium oxide as presented in figure four. Thicknesses and properties of the simulated layers are presented in table two. Now, in order to achieve the mentioned structure, Silvaco TCAD was used. In the simulation, thermonic emission turning through graphene moon layer and Shockley, and Shockley Reed Hall were, and other models were considered, in addition to traps related to considered layers. One graphene moon layer was was considered was considered uh, the Schutzky barrier diode output affected. For example, Schutzky barrier height decreased from 139 to 0, 43 electron volt. Threshold voltage decreased from 1210 to 100 millivolt and also a decrease in serial resistance from, from five to one four milliohm centimeter square. However, an increase in leakage current as presented in figure six. These variations are related to increase in turning rate as presented in figure seven. 
We demonstrated that insertion of graphene neural layer enhances Shusky barrier diode outputs by increasing turning rate. Turning rate. We have now to take into account possibility of tuning graphene band gap and work function. These characteristics of graphene used for controlling Shutsky barrier height, as we will discuss. Firstly, graphene band gap was studied. One graphene band gap incre in in increased Shutsky barrier height, serial resistance and threshold voltage increased as presented in figure eight. And as presented in figure nine, one graphene band gap increased an increase in uh, an increase in leakage current. These variations in the Schutzky barrier, diode, barrier diode outputs parameters are related to decrease in churning rate when graphene band gap increased, as presented in the inset of figure nine. Another important parameter is, is the graphene work function. So when graphene work function increased, Schutzky barrier height increased from 0 0.35 to 0 0.62 electron volt. Threshold voltage increased from 20 to, to 270 millivolt. In addition to a, a, an increase in serial resistance from 0 0.73 to 1, 65 milliohm centimeter square, in addition to a decrease in leakage current as presented in figure 10. The increase in Schutzky barrier height and threshold voltage interpreted according to Schutzky mode rule as presented in equation two, and the, the increase in serial resistance and decrease in. So this is, but we should make a critical thickness of the titan buffer. As you can see, this is a glass transmittance and uh, 5, 10, 20, 30 nanometer with increased titan uh, thickness and transmitter degree. And then sheet reasons also, so above the uh, 200, uh, 220 nanometer, this is a rapidly decreased sheet reason. That means so we should make a critical thickness below the 10, 10 nanometer thickness. That is very important. So now, so we have a, a feasibility test for the graphene growth, uh, the titan buffer deposition, and the CVD. So we already uh, published ACES Nano Journal. Now this is a, a one system. So titan deposition by sputter and uh, plasma CVD. So because the type of uh, graphene is very uh, severe damage from the plasma atmosphere. Because of that, we make uh, uh, substrate and plasma is very, uh, so, 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 so 10 centimeter uh, so far from here, like that. So we can make a titan deposition by sputter and graphene growth at the same time. So this is a, uh, we make a Laman uh, uh, result of the 150 to uh, 80, 80 degrees C. So you can see that uh, all of the graphene showed a monolayer. And then, so IBG and IBG is very uh, nice result. So report the best value from the uh, transport of uh, graphene so 2D band and G band is very large. That means, so not crystallinity is not good for the transfer of graphene, but in our case, very, very small of the after HM of 2D and the G band. This means a very high quality of the graphene at low temperature. So our graphene uh, should be uh, discussed with the some mechanism. So we have a two different mechanism. One is a gas phase and the uh, surface vision control mechanism, but in our case, this is a, a mass transfer gas uh, transfer mechanism compared with the surface vision control mechanism at high temperature. So you can see that this is a mass transport uh, gas mechanism, and then we can uh, measure the uh, heat resource mapping 
So six centimeters, six centimeters like that. So 78 to 83. That is a very, very low heat resistance of our, our graphene. So the, this is a, a very easily uh, checked for the heat resistance. This is a four inch scale pack flexible substrate, grown at 100 degree C. This is a 75 to 81 ohm per scale. This is a very supply data. So as I mentioned before, this underlying titanium buffer layer on the ambient air after graphene loss on the titanium buffer, this is a titanium, all of titanium change to titanium dioxide. So because of the titanium dioxide it cannot influence on the uh, graphene property. So this, uh, this one is a transferred graphene without titanium dioxide layer. So we are using our graphene without the titanium dioxide layer. In the case of transfer process, they have uh, some deep in there. And then the heat resistance is almost 100, a little bit higher than in situ graphene loss. And then we make a uh, FET structure for Dirac voltage. So our uh, dietary graphene loss is a zero voltage. There is no uh, doping, but transfer graphene have a bit so one point voltage uh, positive shift. That means that uh, uh, peed up to by the transport process like that. Okay, so this is a subline data. This is uh, uh, our graphene uh, domain size grown at 100 degrees C. This is a uh, very high, very large. So this is every domain size of graphene is uh, 380 micrometer. So you cannot see any any graphene for the transfer one. So this is very surprising data. So from that one, we uh, make a FET structure. So we calculate uh, some mobility using the uh, gate. Different morphologies requires the design of different types of collector, which is not efficient. The use of liquid collectors in electric thinning can also produce fibers more effectively with diverse morphologies, such as fiber ears and circumferentially aligned fibers. However, the liquid collectors have not attracted much attention in previous studies. Furthermore, in previous contributions, a thick plate liquid collector was used, which is the most basic form. It limits the manufacture of fibers with diverse morphology. The index in the research on the electric thinning liquid collector is necessary for the production of fibers with various forms. It is also important to comprehensively investigate the interaction effects of the liquid collector and the electric form fibers on fiber morphology. This figure shows the schematic of the electric thinning setup used in my study. It can be found that uh, different, different from the typical wet electric thinning using only using the static liquid collector, a metallic sphere was employed to provide the rotation motion, rotational motion of the uh, water inside of the collector. Two interactions was uh, investigated in my study. Uh, as summarized in the red slide, the hydrodynamic in interaction, which is the effect of flow velocity of the liquid collector and the electrical interaction, which is the effect of the conductivity of the liquid collector, and their effect on the fiber morphology, including the fiber mat size and density, the fiber diameter and alignment was uh, investigated. In the first uh, column in the first figure, the aluminum ball uh, represents the uh, uh, typical case as a reference, and uh, zero, from zero RPM to 900 RPM, as the uh, using of the liquid collector with different rotation speed. Uh, it can be found that compared with the typical uh, solid collector, a larger fiber mat size could be obtained when the liquid collector was equaled. In addition, it was found that as the rotation speed of the liquid collector increased, the size of the fiber mat also increased until the 900 RPM case. It can be found that compared with the six 100 RPM case, the 900 RPM case, the fiber mat size uh, was not increased. Instead, it was reduced. Uh, as shown in the insert in the uh, last uh, 
column 900 RPM case, it can be found that uh, many fibers were fused at the center region of the fiber mat. This may result in the uh, reduced fiber mat size compared to the previous case. And uh, um, because uh, the uh, fiber mat deposit on the liquid surface can be uh, uh, move with the liquid collector, and uh, as the rotation speed of the liquid collector increase, there is a vortex uh, generated on the center of the container. Uh, further increase the rotation speed, the uh, further uh, uh, increase the size of the vortex of the uh, size of the vortex was also increased. Uh, it makes that the deposition reach area of the fiber uh, increased as the rotation speed uh, was increased. This, uh, this is maybe the reason of that uh, as the rotation speed from the 0 to 600 RPM uh, was increased, the uh, size of the fiber mat was also increased. And uh, in this uh, research work, only the general uh, uh, change trend of the fiber mat size was considered. So in the 900 RPM, uh, it will, will be not considered in, the, uh, in this specific case. And the red size shows the uh, relationship between the rotation speed of the uh, liquid collector and uh, the fiber mat density. It can be found that as the rotation speed of the liquid collector increased, the density of the uh, fiber mat was also uh, reduced. It, it can be uh, 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 found that it's consistent, consistent with the results with the fiber mat size. FTEI because there are no uh, chemical modification. Has a big as uh, 3288 and 1662 are due to the hydrogen group in the Lanshan room. For black disease, AMC and black disease, SMFC, this is the speed in range of the 2010 to 3650 and 1662. Uh, Christy, enhanced due to the hydrogen groups in glycerol uh, molecules and also the double peak as the 2879 and 2929 and the absorption based around 1110 and 1028 are characterized for glycerol molecule so we can uh, see that glycerol is composed with MFC then compare between the SMFC and SMFC. The absorption based of SMFC are weaker than those of AMFC because there's a lower resin content in the plasticized uh, SMFC. To investigate the making property, we conduct the uh, tensile test using the dog's bond shape. Uh, the test Testing was uh, conducted at the two uh, states, dry states and wet states. In the wet state, we can obtain the wet chain of the uh, MSC film. And here is the result of the dry uh, tensile test. From uh, this figure, uh, just change curves, we can see as this MSC achieves the higher tensile chain compared to the least AMFC. Because the hot stress achievement makes the denser structure and uh, making additional hydrogen bonds. Hence, uh, generally, uh, adding glycerol, you can see adding glycerol will reduce the chance, making a chain and genres while increase the chance at price. In this figure, show the uh, effects of tensile chain elongation and junk models uh, according to the recent concentration. Uh, interestingly, the case of SMSC 2.5% G shows special behavior 
is increasing the elongation while uh, maintaining the strength. It can explain by the two effects of glycerol when combined glycerol and horse pressing treatment in SMFC. First, the plasticization effect of glycerol which reduces the strength. And the second is the forming of additional hydrogen bonds between glycerol and the larsenol also between glycerol to glycerol molecule during hot dressing treatment which will be increasing the strength. So uh, in the case of HMSC 2.5% Z, the positive effect excess the negative one. That's why it shows very special uh, behavior. Water resistance is very important for uh, MSC films. To characterize the water resistance of MSC film, we use the uh, measure the water absorption, chain thickness, and waste chain. And waste chain is obtained from the waste tensile test. For water absorption and chain thickness, we immerse the shampoo in water at 25 Celsius degree for 24 hours. The that the excess water will remove. Then the thickness and mass of shampoo were measured immediately before and after immersion in water. And using this equation, we can calculate the chain thickness and water absorption. In this table shows the water absorption and chain thickness of least AMC and ADMC. It shows that at least AMC exhibits very high value of water absorption at 137.4% and changing it at 79.1%. And the least AFC shows the greatest uh, improvement. Then it proves that the uh, pressing, hot pressing treatment show very positive effects on water absorption and change in tick list. This figure shows the if microplace. It could be well mixed with the binding polymers for the viscoelastic GMR paste. And this GMR paste is easily printed and strongly adhered to any substrate. Also, the fast evaporation of the sorbent in the binding polymers makes the extremely volumetric shrinkage and high percolation network between the microplates. So you can see this ultra-thin GMR sensor which is conformally attached to the human skin. In addition, this printable GMR sensor has high flexibility, which can be bent up to 16 micrometer of bending radius with high GMR performance and sensitivity. Now we have to consider why we need the 16 micrometer of bending radius. Simply to be attached on skin, we don't need such a small bending radius. However, to be applied for own skin electronics, the magnetic field sensor should endure until the extremely complexive and stretchy stage on the complex and wrinkled surface of the skin. So we prepare the stretchable GMR sensors on the pre-stretched Ecoflex. The printed GMR sensors induce the wrinkled surface from the compressive force when the pre-stretched Ecoflex was released. Therefore, the, this highly compliant GMR sensor represents a great mechanical stability and magnetic field sensing capability under 0% and even 100% of stretching state. As I mentioned before, we should achieve the high sensitivity in low magnetic field lanes that is softly covered for the own skin electronics in daily life. So we standardize the magnetic field sensitivity divided by the detectable field lanes as a figure of merit. When we compare the flexible magnetic field sensors, our GMR sensors based on permanently copper microflakes with second antiferromagnetic maximum has 150 times higher sensitivity at 0.88 millitesla of small magnetic field, where the field lanes can cover the wearable electronics 
for daily use. With the same printing method, we can cover the intermediate field range with high sensitivity while using the cover copper microflakes based GMR sensors for the consumer electronics. So our printable GMR sensors have great potential to cover such a broad range application to overcome the limited usability of existing GMR sensor. To evaluate the stability of our GMR sensors for the use in daily life, we characterize the operational temperature range and magnetic field sensing performance at the different angles. Most of the pages have problem of a high thermal expansion coefficient of binding polymers, but the high density and well distributed microflakes in the polymer provide the superior interference of the heat dissipation up to 90 degrees Celsius, where the range is enough to operate on scan electronics and consumer devices. And thanks to the multi axial alignment of GMR microflakes compared to the two stacking morphologies, our printed GMR sensors provide a similar GMR ratio regardless of the magnetic field direction and isotropy sensing performance without degrading the sensitivity under in-plane and out-of-plane field. This omnidirectional sensing capability provides the great benefits for freely locating GMR sensors on scan without pressure pre-positioning of the magnets. Here, we demonstrate the applications of our highly compliant and printable GMR sensors for remote control system, where the sensor is attached on the human finger chip and hovered over a small permanent magnet to control the virtual objects. Under this configuration, Slightly approaching the sensors to the magnets for addressing material. And since ionized calcium could enhance the healing, nano calcium oxide was considered in order to have increased bioavailability. So, in the present study, we have used nano calcium oxide in hydrocolloid dressings. These dressings are basically appropriate for non-infected wounds with low to moderate discharge and they contain a gel forming polymer and when in contact with the wound exudate these gels absorb the fluid and swell to form a jelly like substance which is then confined within the structure of the material the main objective of the research work is to develop nano calcium incorporated Hydrocolloid dressings containing nano calcium oxide for wound healing. Coming to the methodology, the formulation consisted as follows Nano calcium oxide was basically prepared by thermal decomposition method and was subsequently analyzed for its particle size by DLS. For the thermal decomposition method, we used calcium nitrate, which was heated in a muffle furnace at 450 degrees centigrade. And the solution was allowed to undergo complete combustion for 15 to 30 minutes for removal of the carbon content. And then the final product, that is nano calcium oxide, was obtained. This nano calcium oxide was then subsequently used in the preparation of hydrocolloid dressings. The dressings were prepared by solvent casting technique as shown in the table highlighted. Three formulations were considered. All the three formulations contained 75 parts per million of nano calcium oxide and varying concentrations of micronized xanthan gum as well as HPMC K15M. Glycerol was basically used to improve the flexibility of the dressing, and citric acid was used as a cross linking agent for xanthan gum. 
The prepared dressings were then evaluated by different techniques. The particle size analysis of nanocalcium oxide was determined by dynamic light scattering method. The so surface morphology of the dressing was determined by scanning electron microscopy coupled with energy dispersive X-ray microanalysis. This method analyzes both the surface morphology and the elemental composition of the formulation. The pH of the formulation was determined using a digital pH meter. The thickness of the dressing was measured at different sides using a screw gauge. The folding endurance was carried out by repetitively folding the dressing at the same place manually and the number of times it could be folded without tearing was considered as the folding endurance. The tensile strength was measured using a universal testing machine according to ASTM D882-18 standards. The dressings were basically cut to dumbbell shaped strips. Place molecules uh, interact directly to the uh, active channel of the transistor on the interface between the organic semiconductor layer and the dielectric. This leads to ultra sensitivity of such devices uh, in the range of uh, PPB level of our gas analyte and uh, usually to improve their selectivity, uh, especially uh, special layers of our receptor materials is applied on top of the organic semiconductor. Uh, potentially uh, application of uh, different receptors uh, allow to create our electronic nodes uh, with our electric reading, like it was suggested before for optical reading uh, for uh, a series of uh, different dice. We change their color uh, for different analytes. Uh, recently, we uh, created uh, a library of uh, self-assembling organic semiconductors in our lab, uh, which contain different uh, conjugated semiconducting cores, uh, organic silicon uh, head groups, uh, and the aliphatic spacer between them, uh, and usually alkyl end chain for improve their solubility. Uh, as a semiconducting core, we use uh, different oligotiophens, oligotiophen phenylens, or uh, unrelated uh, benzotene and benzotiophen. Uh, since our solution self assembly is quite long pre uh, process, we looked for much uh, faster techniques uh, like Langmuir technique, uh, both with uh, which imply uh, self-assembly on the water ear interface uh, with following uh, a vertical transfer Langmuir budget or horizontal transfer Langmuir Schaefer. Then we use uh, chlorosiline sums. Uh, of course, they first hydrolyze on the water uh, to form silanol or eventually disaloxan groups. And that is why we decided to synthesize directly disaloxanes, which is much easier to handle as compared to chlorosilane. And these uh, disaloxanes are also self-assembly uh, into two-dimensional crystals uh, on their uh, water air interface due to uh, hydrogen bonding between disaloxan group and uh, water molecules, as well as crystallization of semiconducting core, which was proved by a combination of different techniques, including polarizing optical microscopy, atomic force microscopy, uh, and uh, X-ray grazing incidence uh, and reflectivity. Uh, analysis of this, of this data to go, together with their uh, um, computer simulation uh, allowed to estimate uh, molecular packing of the uh, organic semiconductor in these monolayers, uh, in which in this case uh, showed that uh, quantitative core form angle uh, is titled by 14 degrees relative to the uh, director to the monolayer. Then we estimated uh, the semiconducting properties, uh, which uh, showed uh, field effect mobility is high as uh, three, 10 to the power minus three centimeters square per volt second, uh, threshold voltage around 15 volt, and on off ratio higher than 100,000. Uh, eventually, it was uh, almost as good uh, as some fats prepared by solution self-assembly, but much, much 
slow, but much, much faster techniques. Uh, nowadays, uh, one of the most promising uh, organic semiconductor is a uh, benzotiana benzotiphen and its the alkyl derivatives. That is why we decided uh, to synthesize uh, uh, chlorosiline uh, and disiloxane derivatives of these molecules. Synthetic route is shown here. It was not tried for what, and only the longest way uh, through uh, monoacylated derivatives 8 and 10 uh, with follow-on uh, reduction of uh, Dibromide uh, lead to their uh, target compounds. And uh, the similar way uh, was used to obtain uh, sim uh, dimers uh, with shorter spacers, uh, C6 and C7. By this, uh, all these dimers are, were investigated uh, uh, by the Muir technique, uh, and it was found that uh, they also form two-dimensional are monolayer, crystalline monolayer, due to hardest body within disiloxan uh, group and crystallization of BTPD core. Uh, again, it was uh, approved. Through materials made of carbon nanotubes. In general, bucky paper is made by CVD method. But in this work, made by solution filtration method, and it was simple creation. Bucky paper has same strength as CNT, so Bucky paper is also useful in the field of electrochemistry. In addition, Bucky paper is a seed, so it is easier to process than CNT. And since Bucky paper is made of CNT, which is very fine material, it has a large surface area. The aim of my experiment is this. Evaluating electrodes made of CNT using material batteries. Demonstrate the usefulness of ozone treatment. Material batteries which was used in this experiment is this. Material batteries react with oxygen in the air to react electrons. Therefore, the surface area of the cathode greatly affects the performance. Next, I explain how metal air batteries work. As shown in the figure, aluminum changes into ions at the anode and oxygen is taken in the cathode. Overall, Oxygen flows and electrons flow in process to AL, changing to AlOH3. Next, I will explain how to create bucky paper. Bucky paper was prepared using suction filtration method. It was made by dispersing CNTs in an aqueous solution and passing it through a filtration filter. Bucky paper filled from the filter paper has cellulose on it. So remove cellulose using ironic liquid. After that, wash with 100 degrees water to remove the ironic liquid, adhering to bucky paper. Bucky paper is very thin and has little capacity to hold electrons. So, increase the volume by overlapping and increasing the capacity. The created bucky paper was overlapped with CNT as a binder and baked and flattened under pressure. Finally, the remaining surfactant was removed by baking at 300 degrees. Ozone treatment was applied to clean the surface of bucky paper. Ozone excites electrons in the air and eradicates the surface of the electrode to float and remove impurities. A gel type aluminum air battery was produced. The structure is shown this. The size of the electrode is the same as that of the aluminum plate. 
the bucky paper is described as bucky paper hyphen n in which n seats are stacked the anode was fixed to an aluminum plate and the power density of the aluminum air battery was examined this is a comparison of the power density the numbers in the graph correspond to the numbers in the cathode of table the thing which carried out bucket paper with three layers and upright ozone treatment was the highest and no ozone treatment became high next from this it was confirmed that the output was increased by ozone treatment. In comparison between two bucky papers and three bucky papers, it was found that the output increases as the film thickness increases. In addition, it was found that the power density per volume of bucky paper was higher than that of carbon sheet, since bucky paper having half or less film thickness. The internal resistance was lowest for ozone treated bucket paper. Followed by the program is now is focused on the tritium and the deuterium fuelings. Uh, tritium is one of the fuel is one of the fuel reactors fuel. Uh, thus, the tritium but the tritium have very few reserves in the nature and must be breeding tritium itself in fuel reactors to realize the fuel self-sustaining. Uh, in fuel reactor, the helium coolant ceramic braid blanket, the helium coolant ceramic braid blanket at CCB uh, is selected to achieve the tritium breeding. Uh, the tritium breeding occurs in the tritium breeder materials inside the blanket of the fuel reactors, uh, such as these papers. Uh, for example, the lithium oxalic papers is one of the most potential tritium breeding materials. Uh, in the following section, we will focus on the uh, study about the lithium oxalic papers. Uh, in the next section, we will introduce the fabrication and the characterization of ceramic tritium breeder papers. In China, HCTB blanket, the lithium arsosilicate papers with about diameter about one millimeter are selected as the tritium breeders. Uh, at sweep, the melt spray method was select is selected to prepare lithium arsosilicate papers for tritium breeding blanket of fueling reactors. Uh, this this is. This is the fabrication process of the lithium arsenic papers by melt spray method. This is the cross section of the MSM facilities. Uh, there are several advantages of the melt spray method, such as the high density of lithium arsenic papers, the good sphericity. Uh, it is easy recycling of lithium arsenic powders and the easy large scale preparations. This, 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 this picture is our old fabrication facility for pre-research on lithium or silicate papers based on the melt spray method. Uh, in order to increase the fabrication scale, a new facility based on the melt spray method have been constructed. The new facility will have the ability to produce 10 kilogram lithium arsenic silicate papers at a single match, single batch. Uh, these papers were fabricated by the melt spray method. Uh, the diameter is about uh, one millimeter. The paper density of these uh, lithium arsenic silicate papers uh, can reach 96 Six percent sericity density. It is very high. Uh, it's it is very high, and uh, the average crash load of the lithium arsenic lithium arsenic papers about seven newtons in the uh, pre-tried fabrication. Uh, in the following section, we will 
uh, focused on the fragmentation behavior and the mechanical properties of the tritium breed papers and uh, the conduct force distribution in paper bed. Uh, the crash load of papers is selected is selected to characterize the mechanical properties of the ceramic papers, uh, which were tested with an electro universal machine test machines. Um, in order to measure the crash load and the high temperature, we developed a new facilities. Uh, this is our the new our new facility. Uh, the new facility have been constructed for measuring the high temperature crash load of uh, tritium brand ceramic papers. Uh, the majority of the measurement uh, or of the crash load in this study was tested in this uh, facilities. Uh, this is the load displaced curves. We can see that this 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 section this this position is uh, uh, means the crash load of the papers. Uh, since the forming process of resin also select, it is important to increase the efficiency of the motor. These days, laminated core using silicon stasis are uh, using a for a useful motor, uh, such like uh, EVH and a drone, and uh, this. These are need a uh, motor core and reactor uh, uh, core need a uh, small size and high speed rotation and high efficiency. Unfortunately, uh, laminated core is difficult to realize uh, them. And the score is uh, good for uh, low ions uh, with high frequency compared with laminated core. And a uh, higher maximum and magnetic cross density uh, compared with a uh, ferric core. Okay, here is the uh, manufacturing pro process of the motor. The main core is uh, first punching and then interrupting, laminating, uh, laminate, laminate and then uh, winding a coil like this and then solar insert. About iron score, you use just uh, powder and then Press molding, uh, you can make a core. So, uh, fewer production of processes than uh, laminate, uh, laminated iron cores, and uh, high, high degree of freedom in its shape, and it has uh, isotropic uh, properties and can be designed in uh, consideration of a three dimensional laminated circuit. However, uh, magnetic properties are inferior compared to the laminic iron cores. So, in general, uh, iron core often use a binder uh, such as silicon resin or something like that, in addition to the insulating material. Therefore, uh, it is possible to improve the magnetic characteristics uh, due to the high density by making a the score with only insulation uh, materials, uh, not using silicon resin. And here, how to make uh, optimize uh, iron power? Uh, as you can see here, from the uh, molten iron metal, uh, you can use it uh, through with the nozzle, with uh, water, water jet, or gas jet. So you can get a powder like this. And water optimized like uh, another sphere, uh, such a uh, regular shape like this. And gas optimized is a uh, shape like sphere. So uh, uh, these two type different shape has different uh, magnetic uh, properties and mechanical uh, properties. In this time, I use uh, gas optimized. This is the uh, how to make the uh, iron score. Trace it from three-dimensional vessel uh, using uh, iron powder with a ceramic carbon agent and silicon resin, and then press molding at uh, low temperature. So uh, we get an uh, iron score, 
And then uh, on it, uh, we 550 degree Celsius uh, training with uh, reduction atmosphere. So I call it uh, the score A. And so this measure is from the iron powder, just any uh, silicon based insulating fan, fan coating. And then uh, pressing press molding uh, at room temperature. And then I get a dust uh, core. I call it a B as pressed one. And then only from uh, 600 Celsius with uh, 10 minutes. So I call it uh, B0. Another thing is uh, 3D front uh, on any temperature and on any time. So for it B1, B2, B3. This is the uh, uh, iron score. Uh, the inner diameter is 8 millimeter and outer diameter is 16 millimeter. And the uh, thickness is uh, about uh, 6 millimeter. The wine core is H core is uh, 50 tons and B core is also uh, 50 tons. And in here, uh, we get a In order to, to determine the structural phases, XRD analysis of the sample was done on which ceramic top cut, as presented in figure. Metastable tetra tetragonal zirconia and cubic zirconia phases have been determined as the primary phase. Monoclinic zirconia phases has also observed with low in intensity. In, test in the test samples, the hardness measurements were was made with the request superficial hardness method. In hardness measurements, three samples were selected from each test sample group and three measurements were taken on these samples. Therefore, a total of nine measurements were made for an experimental group. The surface roughness of the test sample groups was measured. The samples were washed and dried in an ultrasonic ethanol bed for 10 minutes before roughness scanning. The average roughness value was determined by measuring RI roughness value from three samples for each test sample group. Mercury porosity meter was used for the porosity measurements of the coatings. Measurements are taken in diameters from one millimeter to nanometer level in mercury porosity meter. As a result, total porosity ratio and the total pore area varying depending on the porosity diameter were obtained. All data regarding average hardness value Average surface, surface roughness measurements values with standard error and porosity values of coatings are combined in the table. High temperature to test solid particle erosion testing. Experiments in accordance with ACTM G211 standards were carried out at room and high temperatures using the high temperature solid particle erosion test rig which its schematic view is shown in the figure. Here is the furnace that heats the air and here is the test experiments conditions. This is the high temperature solid particle erosion testing photo photographic view. The selection of temperature for erosion tests has been made based on literature and the values recommended by the ACTM G211 standard. Erosion tests were conducted at 21 and 300 centigrade degrees. The double disk method was used to determine the impact velocity of erosion particles and the experiments were conducted at an impact velocity of approximately 97 meters per second. Aluminia erosive particles with angular geometry and an average diameter of 400 micrometers were used as an erodent in those experiments. Before and after the test, the, the sample weights were measured using a precision scale. To ensure the consistency of results, three repetitive experiments were conducted using the same parameters and the erosion rate values 
were calculated in milligram per gram. Table presents a detail of the test samples. Results and discussion. Impingement angle effect on the erosion rate. Based on the available lit literature, the erosion rate impact and compatibility for Britain materials can be obtained in analyzing the results of erosion wear tests of ceramic top coated samples. It has been interpreted as behavior that we find defines Britain materials in the literature and can be obtained from ceramic materials. The column chart showing the change of erosion rate due to the impact angle after the erosion wear test is shown in the figure. When analyzed at the point of engine variability, the highest erosion rate in the graph was determined to occur at a 90 degrees impact engine. The highest erosion rate occurred at nickel, cobalt, chrome, aluminum, yttrium bond coating ceramic top coats spacement produced with HVOF. Here we see the most erosion rate. In Britain materials, most erosion wear occurs. So first is the battery engineering, and uh, uh, among them, battery engineering and wearable devices. Uh, user, we uh, studied uh, to improve the uh, fundamental studies and functional carbon and functional catalyst is the uh, for the industrial uh, areas. So and this is the our left symbol and. Uh, this handsome monkey is me, maybe in our uh, student. So we are the SEMF. The first is the uh, first research topic in our lab is the uh, uh, lithium ion uh, next generation batteries. As you know, lithium ion battery is a, a very popular research work in the secondary batteries. So, but our research focus the sodium ion batteries and zinc ion batteries. So we uh, we develop and design of the advanced materials for next generation batteries. So next topic is the wearable devices to, uh, you can imagine the in the future we use the uh, wearable and flexible electronic devices. So we need the of uh, flexible energy storage devices. So we target to develop and design advanced materials for wearable energy storage devices. So my background is the material science and engineering. So as you can see, the, I, I did study the various nanostructures and nanomorphological structures and particles, nanowires, porous structure, hollow structure, quotient structure, something like that. Yeah. So this is the general introduction. So as you know, we need the eco-friendly life. So first is the new energy, second is the renewable energy, and the final is the energy storage. So new energy is the hydrofuel cell, a bio, and the renewable energy are solar, wind, water, and geothermal energy. The, my work is the energy storage. So usually we study the secondary batteries. So energy storage is the key part for eco-friendly our life. So this is the trend of energy storage devices. First, we uh, use, we did use the portable devices such as smartphones, laptop, camera, and robot cleaner among them. Robo cleaner is a, uh, uh, recently Robo cleaner is a very good item for our life. So I recommend the Robo cleaner using the battery. So, and transportation and power system. So as you know, Tesla and Hyundai, they uh, have a electric car for transportation. And uh, so we need the, uh, also, UPS and CS, uh, we use uh, uh, to continue the energy, the renewable energy. And uh, we need the many requirements, such as uh, 
high energy density, high power density, long cycle, and low cost. So we need the advanced technologies for energy storage. This is the typical secondary battery. This is the lithium ion battery. As you know, we have uh, many, many uh, professional battery guys and uh, lithium ion batteries converts from chemical energy. That they maybe get between one and maybe almost 10 watt hours per kilogram, maybe a little bit less, but you can see that they have no problem going up to 10 uh, kilowatts per kilogram. In contrast from lithium ion batteries and then some of the other batteries, you can see that they, they can do very nicely with well over 100 watt hours per kilogram, but they don't go up much beyond 10, uh, 100 kilowatt, watts per kilogram. What we really want to do is we really want the best of both words, worlds. We want to blur the distinction between what's a battery and what's a capacitor. And we want to do that by going here. This would be the targeted area so that the material would have the energy density of a lithium ion battery material, but it would have the power density of a capacitor material. So how are we gonna get there? Well, the best thing about research is that, you know, you have to start trying and see what's the best way. And I think it's fair to say that nobody really knows. There's a, there's a lot of work that's geared towards taking lithium ion battery materials and increasing their power density often by making them nanoscale, but that doesn't always work. And then there's a lot of work on taking supercapacitor materials and other carbon-based materials and functionalizing them so that you can increase the energy density. And that works a little bit, but nothing is really in this range. And so really it's a question of how do we do this? What's the best way to, to get about, to get there? So suppose we did, is anybody really interested? Well, I think the answer is yes. We know that electric vehicles are just going to be more and more popular. And we know that no one wants to wait for an hour to have their car charged. And so the idea of being able to have an electric vehicle that can charge in five minutes or maybe 10 minutes is very, very attractive. So as the market for electric vehicles increases, there will be increasing need. People will want to charge it faster. And of course, consumer electronics would love to have fast charging so that you could charge your phone at a coffee break, you could charge your computer just in five minutes. There's a lot of interest in being able to charge consumer devices. But perhaps the one which I think is no one really thinks about too much, but is certainly something for the future is the internet of things. Because in the internet of things, we're gonna have a wide variety of devices. Some of these are gonna be on chip, and that we understand and that makes sense. And those are gonna be almost definitely high power. And the reason they're gonna be high power is because these devices, these are sensor devices, they're gonna to have to communicate to the cloud and they're gonna to have to do that with high power uh, communications. It might be for a short period of time, but the point is it does need high power. And of course that means good energy density. Wearables are definitely gonna to wanna to have good energy density so that you can wear it all day long. So the combination of high power and energy and good uh, high power and high energy density is not just for today's applications that we can see, it's for tomorrow's applications as well. So I have very little doubt that this is gonna be a terrific area to, uh, to continue in the future. So what do we know about this? What can we say about the materials that, that we want and what kind of characteristics do we want? So in one case, we talked about capacitors, electric double layer capacitors. And these, this column is going to be all the type of, of different characteristics. This is the CD plot, and it's a classic box. In batteries, you have redox reactions, and those are peaks that have to do with reduction and oxidation. In between, you have a pseudocapacitor. And these pseudocapacitors are intended to take the best of both worlds. And so let me go through that. So the point is that they're going to undergo redox reactions, and they're going to have two different... Uh Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the kind introduction. And I would like thanks to the organizing committee uh, giving the chance for the, this uh, invited talk. And hello, everyone. I'm Jae-Yoon Jang from Daegu Gyeongbuk Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, today, I'd like talking about the psychological tactile sensor employing uh, piezoelectric materials. Uh, as you know, human has the five sensory systems. So I 
uh, ear, tongue, and then uh, finger or skin and tactile system and uh, nose. And then uh, many science or engineers want to mimic uh, these five human sensory system. And the reason is actually that we succeed to mimic uh, eye and ear. Actually the uh, ear uh, make the recorder and then eye mimic uh, devices, camera, and then uh, reverse engineering that is actuator also produced the uh, audio and television. Uh, as you know, where well, this four invention is the most important uh, invention in uh, last uh, 100 decade, and then uh, they made a tremendous uh, impact to the human life. Uh, so uh, we think if we succeed uh, to mimic one of the remain ones, we also uh, give high impact to the our human lives. Uh, however, when you look at the history of the uh, ear of eye, we know why uh, ear and eye uh, can mimic first. The reason is there for the record of case. Anyway, the input parameter is just one uh, frequency. And eye case, uh, input parameter is three, uh, RGB light. So uh, actually that means the, uh, if we have the smaller input parameter, uh, for the scientist engineer uh, can develop easily. However, unfortunately for example, nose, in that case, there are the human has around the 100 receptor and for dough, uh, generally has the 300 receptor. That means the, uh, we should develop the 100 different sensor or 300 different sensor with a high selectivity and high sensitive, uh, sensitivity. And also we need the high integration skill. So it is the uh, hard for the, our engineer. So we believe the next one is the tongue or the finger because the uh, tongue case, the uh, actually the input parameter is around the five to six and then uh, finger is also similar. However, uh, considering the application field, tongue is a limit. So uh, we want to develop the uh, artificial finger system. Uh, so when you look at the uh, developed history of the uh, finger system, actually the uh, tactile system have been developed well in uh, robot field, especially for the Android robot or something like that. And that field, they want to hold some uh, objects uh, using this kind of artificial uh, tactile system. However, unfortunately, uh, this kind of development uh, does not uh, induce the high impact for the, uh, our life. Uh, ironically, actually, the, the most simplest tactile system, uh, touch sensor, produced a high impact. Actually, the, uh, this uh, tactile sensor embedded to the smartphone, and then they give the uh, high impact. The reason is the, uh, not just come from the hardware issue. Actually, the, uh, it also come from the software issue. So uh, the reason is that this tactile uh, touch system uh, produce new user interface and then uh, they produce high impact for the, our life. So uh, considering that this point, um, actually the, we want to mimic whole tactile system. Uh, that means uh, general research case, most of the tactile sensor focused on the this kind of the physical uh, mimic ones. So most of the research want the, high sensitivity pressure sensor or temperature sensor or vibration sensor. However, if you uh, consider uh, human, actually the uh, human make some, uh, some finger uh, motion using this, this kind of the uh, physical input detection. However, the other point, we also uh, produce some tactile feeling uh, from the uh, brain signal process uh, so our research motivation uh, leads to the, this kind of the uh, physio, uh, psychological uh, tactile feeling. So we want to produce the artificial pain or uh, we want to produce artificial smooth or love feeling uh, using this tactile system. <clears throat> so uh, we want to mimic uh, brain signal process as well as the development of the, this kind of the tactile sensor. Uh, so you can choose the various kind of the uh, mechanism for the tactile sensor. So uh, resistive or capacitive is well known. So we advanced very much uh, 
uh, advanced uh, battery material research work. So before talking about before talking about my uh, copper sulfide related uh, project, uh, I I was interested in about how to control the surface of sulfide quantum dots. And usually quantum dots are synthesized by the colloidal synthesis. And we need to add, uh, I can, maybe I can use it. Uh, I'm not sure you guys can see this or not, but during the colloidal synthesis, we need to use uh, those kind of long chain OLEG exit, which is which is supposed to be attached to on the surface of a PB a transient metal and the sulfide anion. And due to the exist existence of those OLEG exit, we can con we can precisely control the size of quantum dot, and which are strongly corresponding to the band gap of those quantum dots. That's, that is why the major advantage of quantum dot is the high tunable band gaps and uh, large production based on the colloidal synthesis and precisely precise synthetic uh, rows can be obtained. However, when it's when we make this quantum dots to the real electronic devices, those kind of long chains usually usually hinder the transfer of electrons from one quantum dot to other quantum dot. So uh, during this project, uh, my main topic is how to remove those kind of long chain like exit uh, accurately uh, within uh, sustaining its original band gap property. So the first one is uh, we would like to change this long chain like exit to the iodine. So one of the, the atom which is known as uh, the single atomic size uh, uh, molecules and single atomic size uh, compound. And based on that, uh, in terms of the solar cell application and its parameter, we can figure out the, all the related solar parameters, solar cell parameters like a PCEs, uh, short circuit current, shunt resist, and a series of all those, uh, all those parameters which are strongly related to the electronic transfer have been improved well. So replacing exist long chain link exit with the halide ion for the better perturbation and time dependent halide exchange procedure to optimize surface perturbation was one of my research accomplishment in terms of quantum dot. And next one is hybrid ligand exchange. Uh, even just using a one atomic, one iodine related atomic uh, perturbation is not uh, perfectly cover all the location of quantum dot surfaces. So we need to find the other candidate to change this OLEG exit. Then uh, in that case, we use the hybrid ligand exchange method. So finding an organic and inorganic compound to perturbate the surface quantum dot. And uh, in here, we use the pyridine material with iodine. And uh, for the characterization uh, in terms of timing of PL, PL, and FTIR, we figure out the existence of like exit are strongly removed and the <coughs> exciton, sorry, the excitons can be well maintained uh, before the recombination. And finally, we can uh, prove the improved solar cell efficiency uh, between the non passivated quantum dot films and a uh, hybrid passivated quantum dot film. So we call recovering uh, based on using this two different hybrid ligand exchange method by using this hybrid ligand exchange method, uh, we can we can recover not perfectly passivated trap site on previous quantum dot and finally improve all the solar related parameter. So uh, after after those kind of interest in the quantum dot passivation, I am also interested in about how to synthesize sulfide related material. And which is strongly related to today's topic is uh, how to design highly transparent and conductive transient metal sulfide electrodes. As you guys may know, a TC, so transparent conductive electrode, can be, uh, can be used in many different applications. First one is OLED, uh, OLED uh, stretchable LED, solar cells, even. PC heater, even EMI shielding, electromagnetic interference shielding uh, application, all those PC materials and all those PC can candidate should be synthesized and should be applied on the target substrate. And how to synthesize those kind of materials then, and for further pursue the research, uh, research progress in this PC field, 
we need to figure out what kinds of material we are going to select. It can be a semiconducting material. Uh, and mostly for the PC, we need to find a metallic material candidate. And somehow it can be uh, it can be a synergistic combination between inert and the metallic material for the stability under the flexible substrate. And we need to think about how to synthesize those kind of a PCE or electron material. We can use a hydro hydrothermal or thermal method uh, by using a solution-based synthetic wood or combustion CBD method like a metallic MOS2 or metallic graphene can be synthesized under the CBD. Or to design the nanostructure material, we can also use a colloidal synthesis. And finally, for the large deposition, electrode deposition is one, one of the synthetic candidates to make those kind of PC electrodes. And we also thinking about uh, this PC can be usually used as an industrial, uh, industrial target and industrial pur purpose. And to make it more possible to use an industrial uh, industrial purpose, uh, there can be a like low flow process as pre ink preparation can be a too well known effect for the practical fabrication. And finally, we need to we need to check and we need to try uh, the synthesized material uh, various uh, techniques like F F XRD, FDM, PEM, or PL. All those characterized technique has been used. And finally, those after the material selection, synthesis, the practical fabrication, the characterization, it can be applied in uh, energy application like uh, solar cells or other PC electrode like uh, uh, photovoltaic or uh, <coughs> light driven sensors and all those different applications. Uh, and in this topic, we are targeted to make a copper surface, a transient metal surface. And the reason why we are selecting the surface materials, there are uh, many, uh, many advantages of surface materials. First one is a high theoretical conductivity, and second is high applicability under a flexible system. So uh, the future application has been changed and has been drawn to the flexible system. And all those PC electrodes should be uh, should be on the highly conductive and transparent properties on the flexible, even stretchable substrate. So, what is the drawback of synthesizing those kind of surface materials? And as you as you guys can imagine, uh, recently all those surface synthetic materials are strong related to. Uh, Stronger the CBD method or solution-based method. All those methods require a high temperature treatment or a long time treatment to synthesize the structure and not structure and nanostructure surface materials. However, uh, for the industrialized point of view, we need to find the other surface source which can uh, which can convert the transient matter transient matter atoms uh, successfully and then fastly without heat treatment uh, might be a proper and a promising candidate to uh, use those kind of surface materials in industrialization, uh, industrialization. For fibers using wet spinning, the video shows fibers are spinning from needle. The diameter and length of fibers can be controlled. The maximum initial conductivity of the fibers synthesized by wet spinning was more than 17,000 GS per centimeter with a rupture tensile strain of 50%. The maximum strain could be reached to 419% by decreasing the conductivity to more than 200%, uh, 200 GS per centimeter. However, the conductivity of the fiber was decrease when the fiber was stretched, the elasticity of the fiber was bad. To solve this problem, we coated elastic PDMS around fiber, and we uh, achieved excellent mechanical, uh, mechanical elasticity 
and electrical uh, reversibility by coating the fiber and fabric using PDMS. The cyclability was also excellent. The, the electrical performance of PDMS, PDMS coated fiber was demonstrated using LED chips. Uh, to improve the uh, intrinsic, uh, intrinsic elasticity of fiber, we fabricated the fiber using silver uh, flower and polyurethane. The diameter and length of fiber can also be controlled. An extraordinarily high connectivity of more than 40,000 CS per centimeter was ob uh, obtained by silver nanoflowers which is two orders of magnitude greater than that of fibers synthesized using uh, silver nanoparticles. This was due to the enhanced surface, uh, surface area and uh, the uh, coalescence of nano disc shaped uh, petals during a uh, curing process. After the pre-stretching uh, pre cycle, the fiber uh, exhibited uh, excellent elastic behavior. During uh, the first stretching uh, cycle up to 70% strain, there was no hysteresis in connectivity during the stretching and releasing process. The pre-stretched fiber demonstrated excellent mechanical elasticity up to 75% strain, and the, the length of the fiber retained to the initial value after uh, releasing the tension stress. We can twist the fiber into a rope and use it as an elastic uh, interconnect wires. The excellent elast uh, elastic property of the ropes enables selective uh, illumination of a design spot. The LED could be retained to the original uh, position uh, after the illumination. We, uh, uh, we can also uh, knit the fibers into fabric. The pore was first uh, uh, deformed and the fibers uh, started to rupture at 210% strain the connectivity of fabric was not changed and 100% strain due to the structure of fabric. We replaced a long rigid wire using our fabric and it can transfer signal of force and, uh, and position. Uh, next is the stretchable semiconductors. Here are just a show uh, our part of stretchable semiconductors. We synthesized uh, uh, titanium dioxide tubes by anodic oxidation. The film of tubes was very brittle, as you can see the video. The stretchability was less than 2%. We, we embedded the tube film into connective film it can be stretched up to 200% strain and semiconducting properties were maintained because net structure was formed. Uh, we uh, didn't finish it yet. Uh, I will move to the solid state uh, cooling part. Here is the solid state cooling. As you know, with the development of electronic technology, the integration of electronic chips is getting higher and higher, and the heat dissipation of chip is become, mm, becoming more and more prominent. According to statistics, 55% uh, of the chip's uh, filler is caused by overheating, and the current cooling of the CPU is through alumina heatsink, blowing with a fan. The fan uh, does have a good cooling effect. And it can be very small, but when the air temperature is too high, uh, the...
됐나요? 하이, I'm h y u n j i n Kim from c h o n g d o n g National University. I would like to introduce uh, the research what I'm doing. Uh, as you can see, AEM has three problems now. Uh, low ion conductivity and relationship between high o r a l uptake and low dimensional stability and low chemical stability on high temperature. So I try, I try to introduce the branch structure into polymer. Uh, branch structure has a lot of advantages uh, such as effect on hydrophilic, hydrophobic phase separation structure and uh, enhance the relaxation resistance of polymers and improve the polymer's solubility and conductivity. So first, I synthesize the random copolymer and then I adjust, I try to adjust the degree of branching because I, if I make the polymer like this, uh, they will have the effect like uh, local polymer characteristics. So this is called, called the ordering branch structure. Uh, so I want to find the optimum, optimum, sorry I'm nervous, optimum degree of branching which has uh, uh, distinct microphase separation. Uh, these figures are what I got the result so far. So, and I, I would like to <laughs> prove the promising is AEM through the electrochemical performance evaluation of membrane. Uh, such as ion conductivity. Thank you for my presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good job. Mm. Yeah. Found the plasma custom materials. Edge nanowaves is one of the best materials so far. That first we have done our experimental session like this. We have bought all these chemicals from the, some Sigma Alvex company, and we have used the different concentration and we tested for the material. And we have optimized the condition, which is the best material, which is the best condition, and then we have transformed like this. We have grown on silicon thallium nitride nanorods using MBE on the silicon substrate, and then we have spin coated the optimized condition of this concentration PP, and then we have deposited the electrodes for the electrodes on the top of the device, and then we have tested for the material under UV light with the different power densities. After device making, we have to select and we have to test whether the functions of the materials. Because first we check the same image. From same image we can see the different layers of this material. First this is the gallium nitride nanorod and the over the top layer is PPA, P dot PSS composite and top of this is functional material of silver nanobites. And this is the top view of the silver nanobite. Why we take silver nanobites means silver nanobite has a lot of absorption capacity and the more light of uh, reflected light can absorb more on the surface. So it can increase the absorption rate of the light. So further we have tested the UV visible absorbency to confirm whether the absorbency of our sample is depends or not. So in, a, in this process we have concluded and find that the absorbency of the material for the device 4, silver nanowire mixed polymer composite has showed high absorbency and the region is 360 to 265 to 360 is the best region for the UV detection. So after this we concluded that uh, this is the optimized condition and the material is showing high absorbency and then we move to this XPS. In order to make the XPS, we concluded and we, we explained the, the charge transformation. From the C1S peak, this is the carbon peak, one of the base material peaks for the p PSS in polymer composites. When we see that the CS bonds, carbon sulfur bonds, the decrease in intensity indicates that there may be some charge transfer in between the material, like a charge in the junction. Here in the PN junction, there may be a charge transfer through the depletion dish. So further that, the PSS chain has decreased compared to pristine PSS when it mixes with PDO PSS, PPY. Yep, here I can Hello, I'm Tani Kim from Facebook Technical University. Uh, I'm doing test to the first 
hai mươi ba tờ ở cho các số sai cho xem với sở sắp chết is mean quy định có hai crystal quality from it uh, from the amm chúng ta chỉ hai tên mới chờ quy gót smooth surface by etching uh, by select etching method quy determine two type of pit the set and the 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 set of pit the set of two pit different so it should be effect uh, should be different uh, from the t there are two two there are two different uh, two type of pit uh, from the the tm we can know uh, origin of the the type of pit one is the one is the twin effect one is the uh, Third best poster award winner, Junan Bae from Dongdo Women's University. Okay, second best poster award winner, Shaka Palak from Inje University. Certificate and prize, additional prize. Okay. Dongjin Nam, Chungnam National University. Dongjin Nam. Okay. Uh, we will deliver the certificate and additional prize by post. Okay. The best poster award winner. Sanjin Lee from Korea National University of Transportation. Congratulations. Okay, uh, all session is, all morning session is closed. Uh, the, Finished and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. from Chungnam University. Yes, thank you. Excellent work. Second post order also. Sang Hee Kim from the Jungkook University. Sarah from the Chungnam National University. Congratulations. Fantastic. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.